In the 5th century AD, the Roman Empire sank into chaos due to the Hunnic invasions and the migration period. What remained was the Byzantine Empire in the east, with an emperor residing in Constantinople. The Roman Church also survived. Its power was unbroken, for in those hard times people sought comfort in faith more than ever. Displaced Germanic tribes roamed Europe, pillaging and murdering, spreading across the lands of the former empire. They were pagans, and the conquered territories were Roman Catholic. The invaders were too few to rule the occupied lands permanently. Only one Germanic people succeeded in doing so, the Free Ones, the Franks. They already had Roman Gaul firmly in their grasp, and within three centuries, the Frankish Empire grew into a new world power. It stretched from the Pyrenees to the North Sea, from the Atlantic to the Elbe, and in the southeast deep into present-day Hungary. Most of Italy belonged to its realm, and essentially so did the Roman Church. Yes, the pagan Franks had become Christians, quite pragmatically, because ruling was easier with the support of the Church. The mightiest of all Christian rulers, Charlemagne, consistently united the world of faith with state power and realized his vision of a theocracy on earth. At the height of his power, he was crowned emperor by the Pope of the Roman Church on Christmas Day in the year 800. Charlemagne held the scepter firmly in his hand. He was God's representative on earth, and the Roman Church was his tool. But when his son Louis the Pious ascended the throne, the tide turned. The clergy became the real rulers. The emperor's advisers, the bishops, held the power, and the holy alliance between emperor and pope soon turned into a behind-the-scenes power struggle. The sons of Louis the Pius eventually divided the vast Frankish Empire of the West among themselves. The theocracy on earth shattered. Charles II also called the Bald, received the West Frankish Kingdom, today's France. Lotheri became ruler over Lotharingia, which stretched from the North Sea over the Rhine down to Italy. Louis the German got the East Frankish part, today's Germany. While the power of the Carolingians quickly faded, the Roman Church rose to new heights. It owned about a third of the land in Europe and through the 10% church tax that Charlemagne had granted it by law, it became the strongest economic power. By the mid-9th century, Rome became the centre of the Western world, and the Bishop of Rome, once just one among many, now saw himself as the Pope and sole ruler over the clergy, even over all of Christendom. To convince everyone of the legitimacy of the papal claims to power, it was necessary to prove that the earliest Roman bishops had already possessed such full authority. Documents and letters from the very first church fathers were supposed to eliminate any doubt that these so-called pseudo-Isidorian decretals were mostly forgeries produced in the papal scriptoria was completely irrelevant. Barely 50 years after the death of Emperor Charlemagne, Pope Nicholas the Fiennes enforced the Church's claims to power with unprecedented self-confidence. He called himself the judge over the entire world, felt bound by no foreign law, believing he was appointed by Christ himself. With such absolute authority, it was hardly surprising that the papacy soon began to flourish in unusual ways. In the year 900, a new king was crowned in the East Frankish, the German Empire. In German lands, he was the last of the Carolingian dynasty. But he was not a beacon of hope for the weak empire. He was only seven years old, Louis the child. He would not grow up, for he was feeble-minded. The administration of the empire lay in the hands of Archbishop Hatto of Mainz and Solomon of Constance, they governed in the name of the king, for the church, the nobility, the counts palatine, once the pillars of the empire, now only cared about their own interests and often fought each other. Yet now, a strong hand was needed to create unity, to effectively counter the annual raids of the Hungarians. The northern danger was also far from over. The Vikings invaded the empire with alarming regularity. 
And what did the Bishop of Mainz do? He spoke of the deserved scourge of God that one must humbly endure. But there was a strong man in the Empire who could assert himself even among the other powerful figures, who could effectively oppose the ever-growing demands of the clergy. It was Otto, the Duke of Saxony, especially the Saxons, who just one hundred years earlier had been so terribly decimated by Charlemagne, forced into Christianity with fire and sword. These very people had become strong again and remained defiant towards the clergy. Otto had not received his fief, like others, from the hand of the bishop in the name of an incapable king. He was elected by his Saxon people according to ancient tribal customs. But Otto did not come from a ruling dynasty. In contrast, King Louis the Child was a Carolingian. Thus, his throne was unassailable, and Archbishop Hatto could govern in his name as he pleased. No power! Not even the king had the right to contradict the priest, for the priest is the guardian of God's law, while the nobles are merely earthly rulers. Such wisdom was now heard in many sermons. When finally, in the year 911, Louis the Child died in his eighteenth year, a Reichstag was convened. All the Counts Palatine gathered to elect a new king, the rule of the Carolingians had ended in the German Empire. There was no successor. Now, one of the Counts Palatine was to become king. Otto of Saxony would have been the right choice, but many of the nobles were against it. They feared Otto could not only curtail the rights of the church, but also their own. Moreover, Otto was a thorn in the side of the ruling bishops, and how could he govern against the clergy? Otto himself did not want the crown within reach. He felt too old for this heavy task, to unite the empire and the quarrelsome counts against a strong clergy. Furthermore, Archbishop Hatto would surely not approve the election. Hadn't Otto recently let it be known that he would simply dissolve the Archdiocese of Mainz with its vast lands in Saxony and Thuringia? If the choice actually fell on Otto, Bishop Hatto would seek help from the West Frankish king. In the West Frankish Empire, the Franks still had a Carolingian, Charles III. He himself had his hands full, dealing with the rebellious nobles of his empire and the Norsemen, and he did not enjoy particularly great authority. The church was also more powerful than the kings among the West Franks, but Charles the Simple, as he was called, could have intervened if the church called for help. Probably with the support of the bishops, he could have also claimed the German crown. All this had to be considered. Finally, they agreed on Conrad of Franconia. He was a brave warrior and very welcome to the churchmen. Archbishop Hatto himself had proposed him. For seven years, Conrad tried to bring peace to the torn empire. With the help of the bishops, he confronted the increasingly self-willed dukes, tried to protect the empire from the Hungarians, but all was in vain. He did not have the people on his side, only the church. His opponent was first Otto of Saxony, and when he died, his son Henry, who, like his father, was elected duke by his people according to ancient tribal customs. That was a blatant violation of the reigning king's law. Only he could appoint a duke and grant him a fief. Conrad marched against Henry and suffered a crushing defeat. In German lands, one could only rule with the Saxons, not against them. That was Conrad's bitter realization. And so his greatest deed was perhaps that on his deathbed, he induced his brother, who should have inherited the kingship, to renounce the throne. Instead, he sent him to the Saxon duke, to Lord Henry to offer him the crown. Henry was at the bird trap. The minstrels at the medieval castles and courts told the story of Lord Henry and his calling to become the German king, the founder of the German empire, for a long time. The empire that Henry found was, by and large, a rather narrow strip from the North Sea to the Alps. In the west, the territory only extended over the Rhine in places. In the east, the Slavs had advanced around the Thuringian forest, crossed the Elbe and Saale, and spread out in the main valley. 
What lay between the closely squeezed flanks was only partially cultivated land, surrounded by vast forests and swamps. Only on the Rhine and the Danube were their larger settlements, mostly dating back to Roman times. Here goods were exchanged, tools of all kinds, weapons and armor, and finer clothes for the rich. The harsh life was constantly threatened by hordes of various Slavic tribes that haunted the east. The worst were the Hungarians. They came in larger or smaller swarms, invaded houses and churches, stole supplies and treasures, trampled the fields, and killed or abducted the inhabitants if they hadn't fled into the forests and swamps in time. It seemed as if the times of the Hunnic invasions had returned. When Lord Henry was crowned, the royal power lay in ruins. Instead, the bishops ruled, and in the individual territories, the tribal dukes held sway. That constantly led to conflicts, for the dukes had to defend themselves against external enemies, and often enough went to war against each other. For that, they needed soldiers whom they had to pay. In their distress, they often seized church properties which greatly displeased the clergy. No, it was not really an empire that the new King Henry the Fen found at his coronation. It was more or less a collection of principalities that sometimes fought together, sometimes against each other. Lord Henry, as the new king was called everywhere, immediately set to work very energetically. He could rely on his own people, the Saxons. The Franks were also on his side, for the Duke of Franconia was Eberhard, the brother of the deceased king. In his reign, Lord Henry dealt the clergy a harsh rebuff. When Hatto's successor in Mainz, Archbishop Heriger, wanted to anoint him king, Henry the Fen simply refused. Heriger threatened, No one will recognize a king who is not consecrated. Even the king of the West Frankish Empire across the Rhine will not tolerate someone calling himself king who despises the holy consecration to which even Emperor Charlemagne bowed. But the threat missed its mark. Since Henry brusquely rebuffed the churchman, he was quite certain to have the other nobles on his side. And the king of the West Franks, Charles the Simple, had wounded himself when he gave the Norsemen land on the Atlantic coast, the present-day Normandy, and the Vikings immediately established a strong and flourishing state there. Charles the Simple, therefore, had enough to do keeping his own crown. Archbishop Heriger gave in. From Rome, no great help was to be expected, for considerable chaos reigned on the chair of Peter. Determined, Lord Henry strengthened his power over the church by reverting to earlier practices. The bishops were now again appointed by the king, men loyal to him, who no longer used their office to meddle in the affairs of the empire or even to sow discord. Almost in the blink of an eye, he now managed, without bloodshed, to unite the remaining tribal dukes under his leadership. In surprisingly short time, the new king succeeded in consolidating the empire internally. Much greater were the difficulties posed by the Hungarians. Their swift cavalry was considered invincible. To even somewhat hold them back almost exceeded the strength of his army. To defeat them decisively was, for the time being, out of the question. In his distress, Henry offered the Hungarian leaders a proposal they could not refuse. For nine long years he committed to an annual tribute payment if the Hungarians would leave his people unmolested during this time. Thus he had gained time, which he was determined to use. He, the king, therefore ordered the following. First that immediately throughout the counties, stone castles should be built, or existing ones rebuilt. Second, that towns and larger settlements should be surrounded with solid stone walls. Third, set you, that a cavalry force should be established, in which, out of nine men, one should always live in the castle, while his eight companions cultivate the fields, sow, and harvest. Fourth be that from each harvest a considerable portion should be delivered to the castle, both for the maintenance of the riders and as a reserve when the people of the county must seek refuge there during an attack. Fifth and finally, 
that all markets, court sessions, and festivals in the county should always be held in the castles so that the people become accustomed to them and feel at home. It was considered our good right that whoever cultivated the land could also bear arms. Now soon, many would bear arms who no longer called fields their own, but necessity compelled us to act so. This was the birth of the knights, the army of armoured horsemen. Throughout the land they could display their skills in tournaments and measure their strength against each other. It was a weapon of tremendous striking power that was created, and henceforth only the armoured horsemen were considered fully-fledged warriors. But the new elite troops were expensive. The value of armour and horse corresponded to the equivalent of forty to forty-five cows. That was the stock of an entire village. First, Lord Henry led his new cavalry against the Slavs, who were friendly with the Hungarians, and often enough had sided with them. With the new weapon, the Slavs were easily defeated. Finally, the day came when the delegation of the Hungarians appeared to demand their annual tribute. Your journey was in vain, the king told them. The men of my people no longer wish to give anything away, and our treaty from the year 924 is hereby null and void. For the Hungarians, this was a bitter disappointment. They had grown accustomed to this easy way of earning their livelihood. A confrontation on the battlefield was unavoidable. Around the turn of the year 933, their forces rolled from the Danube to the Elbe Valley, flooding through Bohemia. Hunger had driven them to set out in the middle of winter. As the severe cold began to wane and winter drew to an end, they reached the borders of the kingdom, but everywhere castles had sprung up, impregnable to the steppe riders. To bypass the castles and leave them behind was too risky. They would be caught between two fronts, so they split their army. While one part continued the siege, the other circumvented the fortifications to attack the heart of the land. But instead of the expected loot, they found only abandoned homesteads, no livestock, just empty stables and barns. Disappointment spread. Hunger and cold sapped their strength, and somewhere in the forests, Lord Henry waited with his army. Exhausted, they set up camp for the night and posted their guards. The new day had not yet broken when Saxons and Thuringians were suddenly among them, those who could fled in wild panic on horseback. Yet they did not admit defeat. They had never lost a battle before, and now, back in their saddles, they felt in their element. New courage arose. The nocturnal massacre, man against man, was not their style. They stood no chance there. As the new day dawned, they charged again. They employed their tried-and-true tactics, wave after wave, rushing forward with arrows on the bow, shooting, turning, and racing back. But the success was not the same as before. Arrows flew at them from the hillsides, tearing holes in their attack lines. Stricken men and horses tumbled to the ground, hindering the next waves. But that wasn't all. Horn signals sounded behind them. Lord Henry's new weapon, the cavalry, charged forward. That was the end for the Hungarians, the scourge of God. Those who could still flee sought safety. As long as Henry was king, they would not return. Bearing arms and going to battle had now become exclusively the task of the knights. The peasants could not tend their fields and wage war effectively at the same time. The age of knights was dawning. Their castles promised protection and refuge. The warriors needed to be supplied not just with food, but also with weapons, tools, clothing, and all kinds of household goods. So, around the castles, craftsmen and merchants settled. Towns emerged. It was the beginning of a new social order. A year after the great success against the Hungarians, war broke out with Denmark. The Danes were among the Norsemen, the Vikings, who, in the 8th, 9th and 10th centuries, had a significant impact on the world of that time. These skilled seafarers set out from their Scandinavian homelands to explore the entire world, reaching as far as Canada. In Europe, there was hardly a place not threatened by the Vikings. 
During the time of Charlemagne, they raided the North Sea coast in the spring and returned home with great loot in the winter. The Danes mainly targeted the English coasts, but also ventured into the Mediterranean. They sailed up the Rhine as far as Mainz, plundering villages in the region. Centuries later, people still spoke of the northern danger. This was the enemy that Lord Henry now faced. In June of the year 934, he marched north with his new army of knights. The Danes had entrenched themselves behind strong walls they hastily built from the Schlei to the Ida River to deny any enemy access to their trading city of Hedeby. But earthen walls and wooden palisades were no serious obstacle for Henry's armoured knights anymore. To their horror, the Danes witnessed how quickly not only the walls fell into Henry's hands, but also how the city of Hedeby was besieged and set ablaze. The Danish king gave up the fight and turned to negotiation. Lord Henry declared he had no intention of subjugating the land of the Danes or oppressing the people. However, he demanded that the raids of the Norsemen into Saxon territory and Friesland cease in the future. He also required the cession of the territory he had just taken, including the walls and the city of Hedeby, as a pledge. These were harsh conditions for the Danes, for Hedeby was the starting point of trade routes to Friesland and the south, as well as sea routes to Sweden. What do you want with Hedeby, king of the Germans? the Danish king asked. You have no ships, and your people are not skilled in seafaring. What use is the city by the sea to you if you cannot sail it? As a compromise... It was agreed that the Danes could continue to use their city, but that Saxons would also be settled in Hedeby. From now on, the north of the kingdom was spared from the incursions of the Norsemen. Lord Henry was now in his sixty-first year. His kingdom was well-ordered, external enemies defeated, the dominance of the Roman church pushed back. However, the dukes had retained great power and ruled almost unrestrictedly in their territories. But as long as they subordinated themselves to the king, the kingdom was strong. One task remained for King Henry. He had to secure the succession of his rule. This may have caused him many a sleepless night. His daughter Gerberga, he had well married to the Duke of Lorraine, firmly binding Lorraine to the German kingdom. But his four sons may have given him headaches, Especially Otto, who was to be his successor, was not a ruler after Henry's own heart. He strove too much for recognition. He wanted to become emperor, it was said, even as a young man. Henry is said to have countered, My son Otto I, you little upstart, you will never be emperor. But rise he did, Otto the Great, so later times recounted the relationship between father and son. When Lord Henry died in the year 936, the great men of the kingdom unanimously chose the 24-year-old Otto as his successor. Otto had a very high opinion of his royal dignity. He wanted to rule like Charlemagne and revive the theocracy on earth. In Charlemagne's city of Aachen, he had himself anointed with holy oil by the Archbishop of Mainz. The crown insignia were presented to him the sword for protection against all enemies of Christ, the armlets, the royal mantle, as well as scepter and orb. Two archbishops placed the crown upon his head, and King Otto took his seat on Charlemagne's marble throne. Now he was king by the grace of God, anointed by the representatives of heaven on earth. He felt very close to his role model, Charlemagne. At the beginning of his reign, he founded the Magdeburg Monastery and dedicated it to St. Maurice, the fighter against pagans, for there were still many pagans at the borders of the kingdom. Otto wanted to rule, and he wanted to rule alone. He did not want to be dependent on the land's dukes, he wanted to break their power and govern alone. Soon he had them all against him, and civil war raged in the kingdom. For three years, the uprisings continued. Then Otto subdued them all. The Duke of Franconia fell in battle at Andernach, and the Duke of Lorraine drowned while fleeing in the Rhine. Otto's brother Henry and the Archbishop of Mainz were imprisoned. 
Now Otto could control the duchies of the conspirators, but the internal turmoil weakened the kingdom. In the east, the laboriously subdued Slavs rose up and breached the borders. On the other side of the kingdom, the West Franks and King Louis invaded Alsace. Otto struggled greatly to maintain his power. The path to emperorship and a theocracy on earth seemed endlessly long. Yet with much luck, he managed to restore peace in the kingdom and secure the borders. Now that his rule was largely consolidated, he decided to missionize the Slavs and bring the church's salvation to the Danes to pacify them for the future. At the same time, he began to change the power structures within the kingdom. He wanted to make the church compliant with new foundations and generous land grants to dioceses and monasteries. He secured the right to appoint bishops and abbots there or to influence their election. The most loyal of his followers were to occupy these high church offices and take on tasks in imperial administration. After their death, the lands would revert to the king. This imperial church system became a pillar of his royal power and proved very advantageous for the whole country. Thus Otto became largely independent of the goodwill of the nobility, for through the church he ruled the people. A new attraction now emanated from the consolidated German kingdom in the heart of Europe and its king, Otto Wissler, but he was not yet emperor, not yet Otto the Great. Being emperor meant being the protector of all Christendom. It also meant protecting the Pope's seat in Rome. Ultimately, being emperor meant ruling over Italy. And what had been happening in the land south of the Alps for a few decades practically cried out for a strong organizing hand. At that time, there were no cardinals yet. The Pope was elected by the Roman clergy and the people of Rome, meaning those who had the most influence, the Roman city nobility. For the papal election, a God-fearing life was not always of importance. Often, completely different qualities mattered. So it happened that at the beginning of the 10th century, not the Holy Spirit, but the mistress of the powerful Margrave Adalbert of Tuscany, Marosia, occupied the papal throne with her lover, Sergius III. Marosia bore the Pope a son, who would later also become Pope. When Sergius died, Marosia elevated her new lover, whom even her sister Theodora favoured, to the next pope, Anastasius III. He was quickly followed by John X, for the sister pair went through many popes. But when John X fell out with Marosia, she had him captured and smothered. Leo VI, who succeeded him, was also murdered after a few months. Finally, Marosia made her son, whom she had conceived with Sergius III, Pope John the Siendasans. Murder and mayhem filled Rome. One of the Pope's enemies seized him and had him poisoned in prison. This period went down in history as the rule of the harlots, and the papal chronicler Bishop Baronius reported, In this century the abomination of desolation was seen in the temple and sanctuary of the Lord, and on Peter's chair sat the most wicked men, not popes, but monsters. How hideous was the appearance of the Roman Church, as lewd and shameless women ruled all in Rome, disposed of episcopal seats at will, and set up their paramours and bastard sons on Peter's chair. Naturally, many high ecclesiastical dignitaries took this as an example. A contemporary lamented, among the clergy, one finds nothing but opportunities for vile living, gluttony and fornication. They have completely transformed their houses and turned them into brothels. Day and night there is drinking, dancing and gaming. You villains, must you use the legacies of kings and the arms of princes in such a way? But the political conditions in Italy were no less chaotic. The king of the Lombards had unexpectedly died in the year 950, and the 19-year-old Queen Adelaide suddenly became a widow. Margrave Berengar of Ivrea, lord of a principality in western Lombardy, seized the opportunity. He took control over the Lombards and wanted to force the widowed Queen Adelaide to marry his son Adalbert, thus legitimizing his usurpation. 
When Adelaide refused the union with Adelbert, she was, according to the report of Abbot Odilo of Cluny, unjustly imprisoned, frightened by manifold torments, robbed of her jewellery, and in the end, together with a maid, locked in a dark dungeon. News of her suffering spread quickly throughout the Western world. Finally, she managed to escape. A clergyman had provided the widowed queen and her maid with men's clothing. Amid many dangers, the two women made their way to the area around Mantua, where a knight named Azzo brought them to safety in his castle on Lake Garda. From there, Adelaide wrote to the German king for help. Now the time had come. King Otto had to go south. In late summer of 951, he crossed the Brenner Pass with his army and came through the Adige Valley into northern Italy. No resistance stirred. Trento and Verona opened their gates to him. In September, he advanced into the capital, Pavia. Even Milan, the largest city of northern Italy, welcomed him with open arms. After the successful invasion, he courted the hand of the young Adelaide. What woman could resist such a victor? In the same year, the wedding took place. With the marriage, the German king also gained the Lombard crown and now called himself, like his role model Charlemagne, King of the Franks and Lombards. Now Otto was close to his imperial dream. He sent inquiries to Pope John the Funth to see if he would comply with his wish for coronation as emperor. The Pope declined. You are not in a position. Despite his military power in Italy, Otto could not exert pressure on the Pope, for back home in the German kingdom, the nobility was revolting again. He had to return as quickly as possible if he wanted to remain master in his own land. In forced marches, he went over the Alps to the north, toward the rebellious Swabian Duke, but it got even worse. While Otto was still fighting bloody battles to achieve victory, the next uprising broke out in the east of the kingdom. It was the Slavs who rebelled against his rule and Christianization. Determined, he threw his army eastward. The Slavs were not yet defeated when the Hungarians invaded Bavaria. They crossed the Lesch River and attempted to take Augsburg. The people of Augsburg fought fiercely and refused to surrender. Even though the city was surrounded only by a simple wall, the defenders under Bishop Ulrich held out against the enemy for several weeks. But with each passing day, the situation became hopeless. Upon hearing of the Hungarian invasion, Otto de Buffern handed over command of the army stationed on the Elbe to Margrave Gero. He was to deal with the Slavs on his own. With part of his troops, the king hurried through Weissenburg on the Altmühl and Donauwörth towards Augsburg. On August 9th, he set up camp not far from the besieged city and hastily gathered Bavarians, Swabians, Franks and Bohemians under his banner. When the Hungarians learned through scouts of the arrival of the German forces, they abandoned the siege of Augsburg and formed battle lines on the left bank. On the morning of August 10th, the Germans advanced under the banner of St. Michael, moving over difficult and uneven terrain toward the enemy. They were only about 8,000 men strong, but they were heavily armoured knights. The Hungarians attacked with swift mounted archers. A part of them circled Otto's army in a wide arc, fell upon the baggage train with loud cries, and caused considerable confusion. Only Conrad the Red who had been a rebel against the king just a year before, managed to restore order with his Franconian contingent. Now the Germans charged vehemently against the ranks of the Hungarians. For several hours, fierce and bloody fighting ensued. By evening, victory was achieved. The enemy army was driven into the River Lech. Because the river banks were very steep, the Hungarians were almost completely wiped out. In this battle, Otto earned his epithet, the Great. Now he also had the people on his side, and his rule was finally solidified. The Hungarians would not return. However, the joy of the German army was not unclouded. Many comrades in arms had fallen, among them Conrad the Red, who had contributed so much to the victory. 
When the outcome of the battle was already foreseeable, Conrad had opened his helmet straps because of the hot day. Too soon, an arrow pierced his throat. After the Battle of Lechfeld, Otto immediately moved back to the Elbe front against the Slavs. They offered to pay tribute voluntarily but wanted to retain their independence. Otto the Great, however, wanted them as part of his Christian empire. Victory remained on his side. In the very first battle, the Slavs under Prince Stoin were defeated. His head was placed on a lance and displayed in the open field. The victors gouged out the eyes of his advisers, cut out their tongues, and left them lying among the corpses on the battlefield. Not a very Christian act. The German Empire under Otto the Great was finally consolidated internally. Now was the time to devote himself to his imperial dream. After the Battle of Lechfeld against the Hungarians, he had already prudently ordered the imperial crown to be made. It was to symbolize the heavenly Jerusalem, for the Holy Roman Empire was the image of God's heavenly kingdom and thus had worldwide significance. The crown can still be seen today in the Vienna Hofburg. While the best goldsmiths worked on Otto's imperial crown, on December 16, 955, a new pope ascended the chair of Peter in Rome, John the Fulnder. John the Fiend, previously named Octavian, was only 19 years old and not a cleric. His grandmother was the lively and influential mistress of several previous popes, Marozia, who was also the lover of the Margrave of Tuscany. John sold bishoprics and church offices to the highest bidder and spent enormous sums on horses and dogs. He kept no fewer than 2,000 horses, which were to be fed only with pistachios, raisins, almonds and figs that had been soaked in good wine beforehand. Good hay and oats would probably have suited them better today. Under his rule, things were quite merry. People laughed and danced in the church and sang very unspiritual songs. The papal palace was turned into a harem by John the Fusine. No woman dared to show herself, for John, driven by lust, seduced all maidens, women and widows, even over the graves of the holy apostles. So wrote Bishop Lutprand of Cremona about him. It goes without saying that this way of life was not exactly cheap. Pope John the Fiend sought a remedy and found a very lucrative source of income, dispensations and absolution fees. If someone wanted to become a priest, despite not meeting the age requirement, it cost a hefty sum. Large amounts were also brought in by granting permission to bypass fasting. Another source of income was the permission to marry between blood relatives, considering that, according to church law, any marital union up to the 14th degree of kinship was forbidden. Almost every prospective bride or groom had to pay this fee, for in rural areas, almost everyone was related to everyone else. It was this pope who was to crown Otto the Great as emperor. Nine years had passed since King Otto's journey to Italy and his marriage to Adelaide. From the south, complaints were now increasingly coming about the viceroy whom Otto had installed over the Lombards. Spoleto in central Italy had been conquered by him and now also threatened Rome. Pope John Sartusin, as well as bishops and nobles in northern and central Italy, called upon Otto for help. Otto the Great was ready. The imperial crown was completed. He had his seven-year-old son, Otto II, crowned king in Aachen, and entrusted the Archbishop of Mainz with guardianship and regency in the empire. Then, in the autumn of 961, he set out with an army and his wife to Italy. His viceroy had no intention of engaging in battle. Instead, he withdrew into his fortresses, and Otto the Great had no intention of besieging him there. He had other plans. The monk Adalbert of Trier reports, in 961, the king celebrated Christmas in Pavia. 
Then he moved on, was favorably received in Rome, and was proclaimed and installed as Emperor and Augustus by Pope John on Candlemas Day, February 2, 962, amid the cheers of the entire Roman people and clergy. The Pope also kept him with much cordiality and promised that he would not turn away from him as long as he lived. Now Otto was finally Emperor, protector of Christendom. Pope and Church were subject to him. He now sat on the throne of Charlemagne, in the Pater Privilegium Ottonianum. Of February 13th, 962, Otto, now protector of the city of Rome, confirmed the papal possessions, that is, all the donations made by King Pepin and Emperor Charlemagne. Otto expressly declared that he understood his emperorship as a renewal and continuation of the Carolingian tradition. That must have caused the Pope some concern, for Emperor Charlemagne saw himself as God's representative on earth and had allowed the Pope to be only the Vicar of Christ. But by now, the papal dogma stated that no secular ruler was allowed to stand above the Pope. Emperor Otto the Great left Rome to finally break the resistance of his viceroy in the Lombard Kingdom. But while he was still besieging his strongholds, Pope John the Fiend sent his envoys to the Byzantine Empire and to the Hungarians to mobilize them against Otto the Great. This was too much for the new emperor. He returned to Rome, convened a council, and supposedly only here learned of highly unholy things about the Holy Father. The venerable bishops acted as accusers against John the Fool Fiend. One said he had seen the Pope ordain a deacon in a horse stable. Others proved that he sold bishoprics for money and that he had made a ten-year-old boy bishop of Lodi. He was also accused of leading an unchaste life, of castrating the cardinal sub-deacon, setting several houses on fire, drinking to the devil's health with wine, and often invoking Venus and Jupiter during dice games. After the Synod had solemnly sworn to the truth of these statements, they asked the Emperor not to condemn the Pope unheard, despite all the evidence. John was summoned, but instead of appearing, he sent a letter in which he wrote, We hear that you intend to elect another Pope. If that is your intention, then I excommunicate you all in the name of Almighty God, so that you are rendered incapable of condemning a Pope or holding a Mass. Emperor Otto did not trouble himself much with the dissolute Pope. He deposed him and installed Leo VIII, elected by the people, nobility and clergy in his place. In the meantime, John had made off with the treasures of St. Peter's Basilica. No sooner had Emperor Otto withdrawn with his German knights than the Roman ladies demanded their favorite John back and managed, through their influential husbands, to have him triumphantly brought back to Rome. The newly elected Pope Leo managed to escape, but several of his friends fell into John's hands, who silenced them permanently. Among others, the Bishop of Speyer, Angara, was whipped until he died. The Holy Father John the Fetin did not enjoy his new glory for long. He abducted a beautiful woman, was caught in the act by her husband, and was killed, a strange death for the Vicar of Christ on earth. Otto turned his back on Italy. Even though the situation on the papal throne was still chaotic, he was now finally emperor by the grace of God and at the height of his power. He ruled most of Italy, and his imperial church system had proven to be an excellent instrument of his power. He could appoint and depose bishops and abbots. Thus, the church was also subject to his influence. He sat on the throne of Charlemagne, even if his empire had not become quite as large. His stay in Germany lasted only one year. The chaotic conditions in Rome once again required his presence. Sitting on the chair of Peter now was John III. Within a year of his appointment, he was chased out of Rome by the Romans and now called for Otto's help. So the emperor set out for Italy again. This time, he took his son along on the journey. Pope John III was to pay properly for the imperial help and anoint his son as co-emperor, so that the succession to the throne would be unassailable. Upon hearing of the approach of the imperial army, the Romans reinstated John III on the papal throne as if nothing had happened. On Christmas Day in 967, 
the Pope crowned Otto's 11-year-old son as Emperor Otto II. Otto the Great decided to stay in Italy to bring order to this part of his empire as well and to force recognition of his imperial dignity by Byzantium. Southern Italy was still part of the Byzantine Empire and its emperor in Constantinople saw himself as the protector of Christendom, even if he had not done much so far to live up to this claim. But he was the rightful heir of the Roman Empire, not the Pope or the new emperor of the Germanic realm, Otto the Great. This was followed by campaigns against the Italian possessions in southern Italy and repeated negotiations. Then the time came. In 972, the dispute was finally settled through a marriage. The Byzantine princess Theophanu gave her hand to the German emperor's son, Otto II. That Theophanu was actually not a princess, but only the niece of the emperor in Constantinople. Well, no one back home needed to know that. What mattered was the prestige, and that through this marriage the German emperorship was finally recognized by the Byzantine rulers. That was a tremendous political success. Not even Charlemagne had achieved that. When Emperor Otto the Great returned to Germany in August 972, he was at the peak of his power. However, he could not enjoy his fame for much longer. He died just a year later. Contemporary historians praised him as the head of the world, chosen by God, the mightiest ruler and protector of the Christian West. He had revived the theocracy on earth, following the example of Emperor Charlemagne, and once again forced the Roman Church under his rule. But how long would the popes in Rome accept playing second fiddle among the rulers of the world? At the moment, there was nothing to be done about it. Otto the Great's imperial church system was a strong bulwark against the omnipotence of the supreme shepherd in Rome. So for the time being, Peter's successors contented themselves with making life quite hard for Satan and eradicating sin from the world of the faithful. Whoever sleeps with his wife during the 40-day Lenten period before Easter must do some penance or pay 16 salidi to the church or distribute it to the poor. If he does it in drunkenness and by chance, he need only do penance for forty days. Everyone must abstain from his wife for seven days before receiving the Eucharist. The married man who does not abstain from his wife from the visible conception until the birth of the child must do penance for thirty days if a son is born, forty days if a daughter is born. There were many such regulations. Doing penance meant offering sacrifices, fasting and praying. No, it was not easy to live according to the rules of the Christian God. Temptation lurked everywhere. The sin, the evil, Satan. The whole world was the devil's work. The grimaces of Lucifer were the old gods in whom people had believed since time immemorial. Ancient sacred customs were considered witchcraft, and unfortunately, there were still enough people who held on to them. Midwives were very skilled in the art of healing, and their knowledge of herbs was passed down from generation to generation. When picking them, it was important to murmur the right magical words so that they could later unfold their full effect. The church did not forbid the gathering of herbs, but it had to be done with prayers and it strongly condemned that abhorrent spells were used instead of the creed or the Lord's Prayer. A large number of criminal women have given themselves to the devil. Riding on the backs of animals, they traverse vast distances through the air to assemble at the place where the witch's Sabbath takes place. There they serve the pagan goddess Diana as their mistress, if only these were the only victims of their delusions, and they did not drag many others onto the path of perdition. An incredible number of people let themselves be seduced by their lies and deceit, and believe all this to be true. In this delusion, they even stray from the true faith and fall into the pagan error that there are other gods and higher powers besides the one God. In reality, the devil always appears in different forms and disguises, thus deceiving a weak and corrupt mind with various images. 
For the time being, the clergy were content in most cases to bring those seduced by Satan back onto the right path from the pulpit. But it was high time to do penance. The millennium was coming to an end. A fever of anxious hopes, fears, and expectations began to seize people. Augustine had taught that with the birth of Christ, the thousand-year kingdom had begun. Now the one thousand years were ending. Was the second coming of Christ imminent? In the year 9999, many Christians were gripped by mortal fear. They left their fields untilled and donated large sums to the church. Many made pilgrimages to Rome. Others believed, according to the revelation of the Holy Scriptures, that the reign of the Antichrist must precede the second coming of Christ. They thought that in the year 1000, the Antichrist would ascend the papal throne, a throne that many claimed was in league with dark powers, favoring sciences and other devilish things. After all, the Holy Scriptures were the only truth. Everything else must be the work of the devil. Pope Sylvester II eagerly practiced mathematics and had introduced Arabic numerals. It was said that the devil himself had promised him the papacy and vowed not to claim him until he had read Mass in Jerusalem. Of course, there was little hope of that happening, as the city was occupied by the Saracens, and Sylvester II believed he could accept these conditions. When nothing happened at the dawn of the new millennium, people breathed a sigh of relief and remembered the biblical words, No one knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven. But three years later, Pope Sylvester was to meet his fate. There was a chapel in Rome called Jerusalem. Here the Pope read a mass without thinking of the name, and the devil dutifully claimed him. Sylvester's tomb sweated for a long time, and his bones rattled restlessly. Life for people began to change gradually. Perhaps the beginning of the new millennium was seen by many as a new start. A Burgundian monk reported, As the third year after the year 1000 came, Churches were rebuilt almost all over the earth, especially in Italy and Gaul. Not because they were dilapidated, most were in good condition, but because every Christian community, seized by fervent zeal, wanted to have a more magnificent church than the neighboring towns. It was as if the world shook off its old age and clothed itself everywhere in a white mantle of churches. At that time, Almost all the churches of the bishoprics, those dedicated to various saints, monastery churches, and even village chapels, were rebuilt more beautifully by the faithful. This active building was expensive, but the turn of the millennium had bestowed such riches upon the church through the donations of the faithful that it could well afford the construction. It is estimated that at this time in Germany, about half of the land was owned by the church. Hungarian and Norman invasions seemed to be a thing of the past. The population had grown significantly, and the towns around castles and monasteries expanded rapidly, offering good earning opportunities for burgeoning crafts. Trade in goods of all kinds now intensified. Not everyone worked in the fields anymore. Yields had improved significantly with the introduction of the three-field system and crop rotation. Recently, one could even see ploughs with wheels that dug much deeper into the soil. The draught animals managed this effortlessly because new harnesses had been invented that better utilised their strength, the horse collar for horses and the yoke for oxen. The power of water was now increasingly harnessed, not only for grinding grain, but also for fulling woollen fabrics. Water-powered hammer mills for iron processing were the latest innovation. In the scholarly rooms of the time, the monasteries, people now read Cicero and Aristotle. Many clergymen valued the ancient poets more highly than Christianity. South of the Alps, there were said to be even more of these people, who often met their end by sword and fire. Especially in the economically better developed regions, such incredible views began to surface repeatedly, such as the idea that not divine providence, but chance, governs the world. In the Diocese of Utrecht, a priest urged the village elder to take communion. A jug of beer is dearer to me than the chalice of the Lord, he replied. 
and so the church remained empty because the other villagers were of the same opinion. This was rebellion against God. Warnings that literary education led to the foolishness of vain ambition and that eloquence and philosophy encouraged arrogance had little effect. Even pointing out the simplicity of the Greek fishermen who had followed Christ could not dispel the new unbelief. The human soul is nothing. It disappears with the last breath the monk Albert of Metz had heard from tavern-goers in Cambrai. Such blasphemous claims were spreading in the world. Did they originate from the works of ancient philosophers, or was it the disappointment that neither the expected Christ nor the Antichrist had appeared at the turn of the millennium? It was a peculiar situation. On one hand, as a sign of new piety, Romanesque churches sprang up everywhere. On the other, the weeds of unbelief, the heresy, grew rampant among them. Something had to be done. The church had clearly lost credibility, and the popes had lost power and appeal. Pope Benedict IX, according to many of his contemporaries, a depraved youth, had fallen out with the Romans. Before he was chased away, he sold his office to the venerable Gregory VI for hard cash. Meanwhile, the Romans elected Sylvester III as pope. While Sylvester III and Gregory VI quarrelled over who should rightfully hold the papal throne, Benedict IX reappeared, wanting to reverse the sale of his office and reclaim the throne of Peter. These were untenable conditions. The German king had to intervene. It was Henry III, and he came from the Salian dynasty after the Ottonian line had ended. Henry III had not yet been anointed as emperor like his predecessors, but since Otto the Great, every German ruler saw himself as the protector of Christendom. In September 1046, Henry III crossed the Alps into the south with his army, determined to put an end to the papal spectacle. His first stop was Pavia. In a synod, he had a decree passed to ban the trade in church offices. He continued south, convening the next synod in Sutri. The legitimacy of the pontificates of the three popes was examined. Gregory VI abdicated voluntarily. Sylvester III was deposed from his office. In Rome, at the Third Synod, Benedict IX was also deposed. Henry III proposed Bishop Swidger of Bamberg as Pope Clement II. He was immediately accepted, and at Christmas, the new pope anointed Henry III as emperor. However, the popes of that time had very short reigns. It didn't even last a year before Clement II was dead, poisoned, as was discovered a few years ago from his remains. Henry III then proposed Bishop Popo of Brixen as Pope Damasus II. He lived only 23 days. By now, hardly any bishop was eager to go to Rome as a papal candidate. But now the Romans themselves turned to Emperor Henry III, requesting a new papal candidate. The emperor's choice fell on Bishop Bruno of Toul. He was not particularly enthusiastic about the prospect of becoming pope, but was a cousin of Emperor Henry III and could hardly refuse. After a few months of deliberation, he agreed and became Pope Leo IX. Leo's tenure lasted at least five years, and he used the time well. He vehemently opposed the trade in church offices, known as simony. He held solemn services, and as a brilliant speaker, could inspire the faithful. Suddenly the Pope became an immediate experience for the masses of people, and revived faith in his holy mission wherever he went. As his advisor, Pope Leotine chose a small, dark, unusually ugly man named Hildebrand, whom he soon promoted to subdeacon. Hildebrand quickly became the power behind the throne, the hidden soul of all papal actions. When Leo IX died on April 19, 1054, it was subdeacon Hildebrand who travelled to the emperor in Germany and requested his closest confidant, Bishop Gebhard of Eichstätt, as a candidate for the papacy. Reluctantly, the emperor complied with Hildebrand's wish and the bishop of Eichstätt became Pope Victor II. October 5, 1056, is a date that hardly finds significant mention in any history book, 
Yet on this day, something happens that will completely change the balance of power between the Empire and the Papacy. At only 38 years old, Emperor Henry III dies. His son, Henry IV, is to succeed him, but he is not yet six years old. So the Emperor's widow, Agnes, takes over the regency for her child. Pope Victor II, the former confidant and advisor of the deceased Emperor, rushes to her aid, for she is by no means adept in the intrigues of power. But behind Pope Victor II, another is already pulling the strings, Subdeacon Hildebrand. When Pope Victor II also dies the following year, it is again Hildebrand who decisively influences the papal election. Nothing now stands in the way of the papacy's rise to new heights. The goal is the absolute rule of spiritual power over the secular, and subdeacon Hildebrand is the strategist behind the scenes. First, the election of the Pope must be removed from the influence of secular rulers that an emperor like the late Henry III could depose three popes and enthrone four. That must not happen again. From now on, electing the Pope would be the task of the cardinals, who would appoint one of their own as the supreme shepherd. Naturally, Hildebrand now becomes a cardinal. Whether the following event can also be attributed to Hildebrand's influence must remain open. The main mastermind was, in any case, an archbishop, Anno of Cologne. Bishops Gunther of Bamberg and Egbert of Brunswick were part of the plot, as were some German dukes. It was a conspiracy against the now 11-year-old heir to the throne, Henry IV. The Empress spent the Pentecost festival of 1062 with her son on the Rhine island of Kaiserswerth, near Dusseldorf. Before the eyes of his helpless mother, the young heir was lured onto a prepared ship and kidnapped. Henry tried to save himself by jumping into the waters of the Rhine, but Archbishop Anno's men fished him out and brought him to Cologne. Archbishop Anno then pushed through a decree at an imperial assembly stating that whoever currently had the young ruler in their territory should be the guardian of the crown. Agnes, the heir's mother, gave up. She went to a Roman convent. While in Rome, Cardinal Hildebrand controlled papal politics. Archbishop Anno of Cologne now governed the empire. That the papacy now gained the upper hand over the empire is not surprising. In the adolescent Henry IV, the enforced ecclesiastical tutelage must have triggered rebellion. His father, Henry III, still had the power to appoint or depose popes at will. He, Henry IV, was a prisoner of the church, powerless even against the bishops. Declared of age in his fifteenth year, King Henry IV took over the government of the empire in March 1065, as best as one could expect from a youth of his age. Without the power base of his own duchy, he was at the mercy of the goodwill of the spiritual and secular princes, who made governing quite difficult for him. After all, they had to fear for their own privileges if they strengthened the king. While Henry was still struggling to consolidate his power, a new pope was elected in Rome in 1073. It will surprise no one that it was precisely that small, dark, unusually ugly monk named Hildebrand, who, as Pope Gregory VII, took the seat of the Supreme Shepherd. Gregory VII's prospects of going down in history as a world ruler were not bad. Otto the Great's imperial church system had created powerful church princes throughout the empire who could be appointed and deposed by an even mightier emperor. Many government offices were occupied by churchmen. The judiciary was mostly in the hands of the bishops. Now, there was no imperial power anymore, only the young King Henry IV, who was desperately fighting for recognition. Now, all the power lay with him, Pope Gregory VII, that his claim to absolute rule over all of Christendom, even over the entire world, was beyond question, was to be proven once again by the documents and letters of the very first bishops of Rome, the so-called pseudo-Isidorian decretals, known forgeries from the pens of papal scribes of the ninth century. According to Gregory's principle, the Pope was the vicar of God. God had given him the whole world as a fief. 
From this, it followed that all secular rulers could only receive their possessions as fiefs from the hands of the Pope. Any ruler who did not comply was threatened with excommunication. In his Dictatus Papae, his chancellery principles, he revealed the new course of the Church, Quod Romana Ecclesia a solo domino sit fundata, that the Roman Church was founded by the Lord alone. In this delusion they even stray from the true faith and fall into the pagan error that there are other gods and higher powers besides the one God. In reality, the devil constantly appears in different forms and disguises, deceiving a weak and fallen mind with various images. For the time being, the clergy were content in most cases to bring those seduced by Satan back onto the right path from the pulpit. But it was high time to do penance. The millennium was coming to an end. A fever of anxious hopes, fears and expectations began to seize people. Augustine had taught that with the birth of Christ, the thousand-year kingdom had begun. Now the one thousand years were ending. Was the second coming of Christ imminent? In the year 999, many Christians were gripped by mortal fear. They left their fields untilled and donated large sums to the church. Many made pilgrimages to Rome. Others believed, according to the revelation of the Holy Scriptures, that the reign of the Antichrist must precede the second coming of Christ. They thought that in the year 1000 he would ascend the papal throne, a throne that everyone claimed was in league with dark powers, favoring the sciences and similar devilish things. After all, the Holy Scriptures were the only truth. Everything else must be the work of the devil. Pope Sylvester II eagerly practiced mathematics and had introduced Arabic numerals. It was said that the devil himself had promised him the papacy and vowed not to claim him until he had read Mass in Jerusalem. Of course, there was little hope of that happening, as the city was occupied by the Saracens, and Sylvester II believed he could accept these conditions. When nothing happened at the dawn of the new millennium, people breathed a sigh of relief and remembered the biblical words, No one knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven. But three years later, Pope Sylvester was to meet his fate. There was a chapel in Rome called Jerusalem. Here the Pope read a mass without thinking of the name, and the devil dutifully claimed him. Sylvester's tomb sweated for a long time, and his bones rattled restlessly. Life for people began to change gradually. Perhaps the beginning of the new millennium was seen by many as a new start. A Burgundian monk reported, As the third year after the year 1000 came, churches were rebuilt almost all over the earth, especially in Italy and Gaul. Not because they were dilapidated, most were in good condition, but because every Christian community seized by fervent zeal wanted to have a more magnificent church than the neighboring towns. It was as if the world shook off its old age and clothed itself everywhere in a white mantle of churches. At that time, almost all the churches of the bishoprics, those dedicated to various saints, monastery churches, and even village chapels were rebuilt more beautifully by the faithful. This active building was expensive, but the turn of the millennium had bestowed such riches upon the church through the donations of the faithful that it could well afford the construction. It is estimated that at this time in Germany, about half of the land was owned by the church. Hungarian and Norman invasions seemed to be a thing of the past. The population had grown significantly, and the towns around castles and monasteries expanded rapidly, offering good earning opportunities for burgeoning crafts. Trade in goods of all kinds now intensified. Not everyone worked in the fields anymore. Yields had improved significantly with the introduction of the three-field system and crop rotation. Recently, one could even see ploughs with wheels that dug much deeper into the soil. The draught animals managed this effortlessly because new harnesses had been invented that better utilised their strength, the horse collar for horses and the yoke for oxen. 
the power of water was now increasingly harnessed, not only for grinding grain, but also for fulling woolen fabrics. Water-powered hammer mills for iron processing were the latest innovation. In the scholarly rooms of the time, the monasteries, people now read Cicero and Aristotle. Many clergymen valued the ancient poets more highly than Christianity. South of the Alps, there were said to be even more of these people, who often met their end by sword and fire. Especially in the economically better developed regions, such incredible views began to surface repeatedly, such as the idea that not divine providence but chance governs the world. In the Diocese of Utrecht, a priest urged the village elder to take communion. A jug of beer is dearer to me than the chalice of the Lord, he replied. And so the church remained empty, because the other villagers were of the same opinion. This was rebellion against God. Warnings that literary education led to the foolishness of vain ambition, and that eloquence and philosophy encouraged arrogance had little effect. Even pointing out the simplicity of the Greek fishermen who had followed Christ could not dispel the new unbelief. The human soul is nothing. It disappears with the last breath, the monk Albert of Metz had heard from tavern-goers in Cambrai. Such blasphemous claims were spreading in the world. Did they originate from the works of ancient philosophers, or was it the disappointment that neither the expected Christ nor the Antichrist had appeared at the turn of the millennium? It was a peculiar situation. On one hand, as a sign of new piety, Romanesque churches sprang up everywhere. On the other, the weeds of unbelief, the heresy, grew rampant among them. Something had to be done. The church had clearly lost credibility, and the popes had lost power and appeal. Pope Benedict IX, according to many of his contemporaries, a depraved youth, had fallen out with the Romans. Before he was chased away, he sold his office to the venerable Gregory VI for hard cash. Meanwhile, the Romans elected Sylvester III as Pope. While Sylvester III and Gregory VI quarreled over who should rightfully hold the papal throne, Benedict IX reappeared, wanting to reverse the sale of his office and reclaim the throne of Peter. These were untenable conditions. The German king had to intervene. It was Henry III, and he came from the Salian dynasty after the Ottonian line had ended. Henry III had not yet been anointed as emperor like his predecessors, but since Otto the Great, every German ruler saw himself as the protector of Christendom. In September 1046, Henry III crossed the Alps into the south with his army, determined to put an end to the papal spectacle. His first stop was Pavia. In a synod, he had a decree passed to ban the trade in church offices. He continued south, convening the next synod in Sutri. The legitimacy of the pontificates of the three popes was examined. Gregory VI abdicated voluntarily. Sylvester III was deposed from his office. In Rome, at the Third Synod, Benedict IX was also deposed. Henry III proposed Bishop Swidger of Bamberg as Pope Clement II. He was immediately accepted, and at Christmas the new Pope anointed Henry III as Emperor. However, the Popes of that time had very short reigns. It didn't even last a year before Clement II was dead, poisoned, as was discovered a few years ago from his remains. Henry Adruti then proposed Bishop Popo of Brixen as Pope Damasus II. He lived only 23 days. By now, hardly any bishop was eager to go to Rome as a papal candidate. But now the Romans themselves turned to Emperor Henry III, requesting a new papal candidate. The emperor's choice fell on Bishop Bruno of Toul. He was not particularly enthusiastic about the prospect of becoming pope, but was a cousin of Emperor Henry III and could hardly refuse. After a few months of deliberation, he agreed and became Pope Leo IX. Leo's tenure lasted at least five years, and he used the time well. He vehemently opposed the trade in church offices known as simony. 
He held solemn services and, as a brilliant speaker, could inspire the faithful. Suddenly, the Pope became an immediate experience for the masses of people and revived faith in his holy mission wherever he went. As his advisor, Pope Leo IX chose a small, dark, unusually ugly man named Hildebrand, whom he soon promoted to subdeacon. Hildebrand quickly became the power behind the throne, the hidden soul of all papal actions. When Leo IX died on April 19, 1054, it was subdeacon Hildebrand who travelled to the emperor in Germany and requested his closest confidant, Bishop Gebhard of Eichstätt, as a candidate for the papacy. Reluctantly, the emperor complied with Hildebrand's wish, and the Bishop of Eichstätt became Pope Victor II. October 5, 1056 is a date that hardly finds significant mention in any history book, yet on this day something happens that will completely change the balance of power between the Empire and the Papacy. At only 38 years old, Emperor Henry III dies. His son, Henry IV, is to succeed him, but he is not yet six years old. So the Emperor's widow, Agnes, takes over the regency for her child. Pope Victor II, the former confidant and advisor of the deceased emperor, rushes to her aid, for she is by no means adept in the intrigues of power. But behind Pope Victor II, another is already pulling the strings, subdeacon Hildebrand. When Pope Victor II also dies the following year, it is again Hildebrand who decisively influences the papal election. Nothing now stands in the way of the papacy's rise to new heights. The goal is the absolute rule of spiritual power over the secular, and subdeacon Hildebrand is the strategist behind the scenes. First, the election of the Pope must be removed from the influence of secular rulers. That an emperor like the later Henry II could depose a three poppies and enthrone a four, that must not happen again. From now on, electing the Pope would be the task of the Cardinals, who would appoint one of their own as the Supreme Shepherd. Naturally, Hildebrand now becomes a Cardinal. Whether the following event can also be attributed to Hildebrand's influence must remain open. The main mastermind was, in any case, an Archbishop, Anno of Cologne. Bishops Gunther of Bamberg and Egbert of Brunswick were part of the plot, as were some German dukes. It was a conspiracy against the now 11-year-old heir to the throne, Henry IV. The Empress spent the Pentecost festival of 1062 with her son on the Rhine island of Kaiserswerth, near Dusseldorf. Before the eyes of his helpless mother, the young heir was lured onto a prepared ship and kidnapped. Henry tried to save himself by jumping into the waters of the Rhine, but Archbishop Anno's men fished him out and brought him to Cologne. Archbishop Anno then pushed through a decree at an imperial assembly stating that whoever currently had the young ruler in their territory should be the guardian of the crown. Agnes, the heir's mother, gave up. She went to a Roman convent. While in Rome, Cardinal Hildebrand controlled papal politics, Archbishop Anno of Cologne now governed the empire. That the papacy now gained the upper hand over the empire is not surprising. In the adolescent Henry IV, the enforced ecclesiastical tutelage must have triggered rebellion. His father, Henry III, still had the power to appoint or depose popes at will. He, Henry IV, was a prisoner of the church, powerless even against the bishops. Declared of age in his fifteenth year, King Henry IV took over the government of the empire in March 1065, as best as one could expect from a youth of his age. Without the power base of his own duchy, he was at the mercy of the goodwill of the spiritual and secular princes, who made governing quite difficult for him. After all, they had to fear for their own privileges if they strengthened the king. While Henry was still struggling to consolidate his power, a new pope was elected in Rome in 1073. It will surprise no one that it was precisely that small, dark, unusually ugly monk named Hildebrand who, as Pope Gregory VII, took the seat of the Supreme Shepherd. 
Gregory VII's prospects of going down in history as a world ruler were not bad. Otto the Great's imperial church system had created powerful church princes throughout the empire who could be appointed and deposed by an even mightier emperor. Many government offices were occupied by churchmen. The judiciary was mostly in the hands of the bishops. Now, there was no imperial power anymore. Only the young King Henry IV, who was desperately fighting for recognition. Now, all the power lay with him, Pope Gregory VII. That his claim to absolute rule over all of Christendom, even over the entire world, was beyond question was to be proven once again by the documents and letters of the very first bishops of Rome, the so-called Pseudo-Isidorian Decretals, known forgeries from the pens of papal scribes of the ninth century. According to Gregory's principle, the Pope was the vicar of God. God had given him the whole world as a fief. From this, it followed that all secular rulers could only receive their possessions as fiefs from the hands of the Pope. Any ruler who did not comply was threatened with excommunication. In his Dictatus Papae, his chancellery principles, he revealed the new course of the Church. Quod Romana Ecclesia, a solo domino, sit fundata, that the Roman Church was founded by the Lord alone. Quod solus Romanus Pontifex Jure Dicatur Universalis, that only the Roman bishop is rightly called universal. Quod solus posit episcopos deponere vel reconciliare, that he alone can depose or reinstate bishops. Quod solus imperialis insignias utiposit, that he alone can use the imperial insignia. Quod omnes principis solius papepedes osculentur, that all princes shall kiss the Pope's feet alone. Quod illi liceat imperatores deponere, that it is allowed for him to depose emperors. Quod sententia ilius a nullo debit retractari et ipsa omnium solus retractare posit, that his judgment may be retracted by no one, and he alone can retract the judgments of all. Quod a nemine ipse judicari debit, that he should be judged by no one. Quod Romanam ecclesiam nunquam erase nec in perpetuum scriptura testatur eraturam, that the Roman Church has never erred and, as attested by Scripture, will never err to all eternity. Quod Romanus Pontifex, si canonice fuerit ordinatus, meritis beati petri indubitanter efficitur sanctus, that the Roman Pontiff, if canonically ordained, becomes holy without doubt through the merits of St. Peter. To carry out his ambitious plans, Gregory VII deemed it necessary to sever the clergy from all bonds that connected them with civil society and the state. They should have no other interest than that of the church and belong to it with body and soul. Since family ties are the strongest and most influential of all, he undertook at any cost to eradicate marriage among clergy. That other motives played a role in the background is shown by a council from the year 1278, about 100 years later. The priests had not immediately given up the fight for their wives. It says in one of the decrees, Since carnal lust dishonors the clerical state in many ways, especially when it comes to begetting children, we decree that clerics, especially those in holy orders, shall not presume to bequeath anything by will to their sons born in the clerical state and to their concubines. Such legacies shall fall to the church of the place. The Gregorian reform is considered an outstanding achievement of Gregory VII and went down in church history. But it did not exhaust itself in the demand for clerical celibacy. One of the main goals was to prevent the appointment of archbishops, bishops, and abbots by secular rulers. Investiture is the ceremony in which the emperor elevated the future bishop to imperial prince and endowed him with land. The bishop was now the vassal of the emperor. At the same time, the ruler presented him with a ring as a sign of the bishop's marriage to the empire and the shepherd's staff 
the symbol of the spiritual shepherd. Until this ceremony had taken place, the cleric was not installed in his office. This was the bond by which the bishops were connected to the secular prince. Gregory wanted to sever this bond to deprive the secular power of all authority over the church and its servants. At a synod in 1075, he issued a decree that forbade all clerics, under penalty of losing their offices, from receiving investiture from the hand of a layperson, a non-cleric. Laymen who acted contrary to this were punished with excommunication. The princes were astonished by the new presumption of the supreme Shepherg and paid no attention to his commons. However, Grigori knew very well what he could dara. He did not bother with the lesser princes. He wanted to show them his power by directing it against the most respected among them, King Henry IV. When Henry IV disregarded the Pope's new claims and continued to appoint bishops in Germany and Italy, according to customary practice, the inevitable happened. At New Year's in 1076, the King received a threatening letter from the Pope, summoning him to Rome to answer before the Supreme Shepherd. Henry IV was outraged by this insolence and convened a synod in Worms. Here, Cardinal Hugo Candidus, who had promoted Gregory to the papal throne, bypassing the other cardinals, made serious moral accusations against the Supreme Shepherd. Twenty-six German church princes then unanimously declared Gregory VII deposed. A royal letter with this information was sent to Rome and publicly read there. A synod of Lombard bishops in Piacenza joined the judgment of Worms. Even in Rome, a crowd of excommunicated persons rose against the Pope and attacked him in the church as he was celebrating High Mass. They dragged him by the hair into prison. But Gregory had not only enemies in Rome. Above all, Matilda, the powerful Margravine of Tuscany, was very devoted to him, and so he was quickly set free. The Supreme Shepherd was not a man to give in easily and so a response to Henry IV was not long in coming. Holy Peter, first among the apostles, hear me, your servant, through your power, for the honor and protection of your church, in the name of Almighty God, I say to King Henry, who has risen against your church in unheard of presumption, I deprive him of the government of the German and Italian realms. I release all Christians from the oath they have taken or will take to him, and hereby forbid anyone to serve him as king. Along with the excommunication, a host of monks flooded all of Germany and worked on the people. At first, the Germans stood almost unanimously against the audacious Pope, but quickly the king's loyal followers deserted him, except for one, Duke Godfrey of Lorraine but assassins removed him from the way. The princes gathered at Trebur and declared to the king that his reign would be over if he did not free himself from the ban within a year. When Henry IV wanted to negotiate with the Pope to avert disaster, the princes called for a Reichstag in Augsburg. The Pope was also invited and set out on the journey. Henry's opponents were forming an alliance. No one stood by the king any more. Depressed by the dark spirit of his time, abandoned by all the world, only a few soldiers were still with him, the German king decided to go to Rome in a penitent's robe and reconcile with his now terribly powerful adversary. In bitter cold, it was a harsh winter that year, he hurried with his wife and son through Burgundy and over the Mont Cenis into northern Italy. The Italians flocked to him and demanded he should confront the rebellious prelates at the head of an army, but the ruler's courage was broken. He wanted humbly to implore Gregory's mercy. Gregory had not dreamed that Henry would submit. On his journey to Augsburg, he had already reached Lombardy when he heard of the emperor's arrival. He fled hastily to the strong castle of Canossa, which belonged to his confidant, the wealthy Margravine Matilda of Tuscany. Here, on January 25th, 1077, the German king appeared in a simple penitent's robe, bareheaded and barefoot. Thus he stood in the courtyard before the inner ring wall of the castle. 
three days and three nights, shivering in the snow from frost and weak from hunger and thirst. From the windows of the castle, Gregory looked down, alongside his confidant, upon his humiliated enemy, and would have liked to see him die like this. The Pope's inhuman hardness caused all the household to murmur, and finally he yielded to the pleas of the Margravine, who, though an enemy of Henry, was more compassionate and led the Emperor to the altar. Here Gregory broke a host, the Eucharistic bread. If I am guilty of the crimes of which you accused me in worms, may God the Lord punish me with sudden death, said the Pope, and took half of the host. Gregory was neither superstitious nor nervous. He remained alive. The other half was taken by Henry, but the condition was harsh. If you justify yourself at the convened Reichstag and regain the crown, you shall be obedient and submissive to me. Henry IV returned to Germany, but the German princes were now no longer satisfied with their king and elected another, Rudolf of Swabia. Now civil war broke out. Gregory V.I. remained quit as long as nothing decisive happened. But when Henry was defeated in a battle, he sent the anti-king a crown with the proud inscription, The Lord gives, Peter gives, Peter gave the crown to Rudolf. Over Henry he again pronounced the church ban. But this time the excommunication missed its effect, the political purpose was too obvious, and so Henry could gather enough loyal followers around him. Above all, the citizens of the rapidly growing cities were on the king's side, as they often had enough of the tyranny of their bishops. On three synods, they deposed Gregory VII and elected the Archbishop of Ravenna as supreme shepherd. As Clement III, he ascended the papal throne. Gregory, the deposed Pope, ominously prophesied that within the same year, before the Feast of St. Peter, a false king would die. To ensure that his prophecy would also be fulfilled concerning Henry, he sent out some assassins. But Gregory's intention turned into a blessing for Henry. On June 15, 1080, he defeated Rudolf. Rudolf had his right hand cut off before the battle, the hand with which he had sworn loyalty to Henry IV. He died on the battlefield from this injury. This was considered a sign from heaven, a fulfillment of Gregory's prophecy, though not quite in the prophet's sense. Now Henry advanced against Rome, destroyed the army of the papal ally Matilda, conquered the city, and besieged the raging Gregory VII in the Castel Sant'Angelo. The Normans, whom Gregory had called for help and who ruled in southern Italy at that time, advanced with 30,000 men. But instead of freeing Gregory, they captured the city and reduced Rome to rubble and ashes. Now Gregory had to flee from the wrath of the Romans. He went to Salerno to the Normans, where he died shortly thereafter. He was the son of a blacksmith, then the monk Hildebrand. Later writers gave him the name Hölenbrand, Hellfire. Finally, he became Pope Gregory VII, he wanted to force the kingdom of God on earth and died in the end like a toppled tyrant. For Henry IV, Gregory's death must have been a great relief. Otto the Great's imperial church system had been restored once more, and with Clement III there was again a pope on the throne of Peter who did not fight against it. Henry IV had elevated him to the papacy, and in return Clement III anointed Henry IV as emperor. Suddenly the world was simple again, but the truce between the empire and the papacy would not last long. Already in the year 1122, the Roman Church would carry off the victory in the conflict over investiture at the Concordat of Worms against the son of Henry IV, from the document of Henry V. In the name of the holy and undivided Trinity, I, Henry, by the grace of God, ordained Emperor of the Romans, for the love of God and the Holy Roman Church and of Lord Pope Calixtus, and for the salvation of my soul, give up to God and his holy apostles Peter and Paul and the Holy Catholic Church, all investiture with ring and staff. I allow that in all the churches of my kingdom and empire, canonical elections and free consecrations take place. 
all possessions and regalia of St. Peter, which from the beginning of this dispute until today, whether in my father's time or in mine, have been taken away, I restore to the same holy Roman church as far as I have them. Those which I do not possess, I will faithfully help to have returned. I grant true peace to Lord Pope Calixtus and the Holy Roman Church, and to all who stand or have stood on his side. And wherever the Holy Roman Church requires help, I will faithfully assist, and where it brings complaints before me, I will provide justice as is proper. And so the dispute over the right to appoint bishops would end with the emperor's defeat in the Concordat of Worms. The papacy's striving for absolute power had become the obsession of the Roman Church, following the example of Gregory VII. In the year 1095, Pope Urban II convened a synod in Clermont-Ferrand to combat the growing unbelief and immorality and to help the declining church rise again, to rebuild discipline and morals, and to restore the peace that had vanished from the world. The Pope spoke under the open sky, as no building could accommodate the fourteen archbishops, two hundred and twenty-five bishops, four hundred abbots, and the vast masses of lower clergy and lay people who were present. The godless followers of the Saracens oppressed the holy places that have been trodden by the feet of the Lord for a long time with their tyranny, and hold the faithful in bondage and subjugation. The dogs have entered the sanctuary, and the Holy of Holies is desecrated. The people who worship the true God are humiliated. The chosen people must suffer unworthy oppression. The royal priesthood must bake bricks as slaves. The princes of the lands, the city of God, must pay tribute. Does not one's soul melt away over this? Does not one's heart break over this? Dear brothers, who can hear this with dry eyes? the temple of the Lord, from which he, in his zeal, drove out the buyers and sellers, so that the house of his father would not become a den of thieves, has now become the seat of the devil. The city of the king of all kings, who gave the laws of the pure faith, must serve pagan superstition. The church of the holy resurrection, the resting place of the Lord, is under the dominion of those who will have no part in the resurrection, but must serve as stubble for the eternal infernal fire. The venerable places have been turned into stables and stalls. The praiseworthy people have their sons taken away and are forced to serve pagan impurity and to deny the name of the living God and to blaspheme with impious mouths. And if they resist the godless commands, they are slaughtered like cattle. They slaughter the priests in the sanctuary, we who are sunk in the misery of this perilous time, of which the pious King David, foreseeing in the spirit, spoke lamentations. O God, the heathens have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. How long, O Lord, arm yourselves with the zeal of God, dear brothers. Gird your precious swords at your sides. Arm yourselves and be sons of the mighty. It is better to die in battle than to see our people and the holy places suffer. Whoever is zealous for the law of God, let him join us. We want to help our brothers. Set out and the Lord will be with you. Turn the weapons with which you sinfully shed the blood of brothers against the enemies of the Christian name and faith. Thieves, robbers, arsonists, and murderers, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Acquire for yourselves, through pleasing obedience, the grace of God, so that he may quickly forgive you your sins, which have aroused his wrath, for the sake of such pious works and united intercessions. We, however, grant, through the mercy of God and supported by the holy apostles Peter and Paul, to all faithful Christians who take up arms against the heathens and undertake the burden of this pilgrimage, the remission of all punishments that the church has imposed upon them for their sins. And if one dies there in true repentance, he may firmly believe that the forgiveness of his sins and the fruit of eternal life will be granted to him.
In the meantime, we consider those who, in faith, wish to undertake this battle as children of true obedience and place them under the protection of the Church and the holy apostles Peter and Paul. They shall be secured against any disturbance of their property or persons. It became evident that the work was blessed by God. For old and young followed this call with the greatest joy, difficult as it demanded, and not only those personally present were inspired by the fire of the words of the Holy Father. The sermon went out into all the world and ignited even those who had not heard it from his mouth to the same resolve. Thus men parted from their wives, and wives from their husbands, fathers from sons, and sons from fathers. There was no bond of love that could hinder this zeal, so that many monks came out of their monasteries, and many who had voluntarily enclosed themselves for the Lord's sake came out of their cloisters. However, not all were prompted in their decision by love for God, and not all were driven by wise consideration. Many joined merely so as not to leave their friends, or so as not to be considered lazy or out of frivolity, or to mock their creditors to whom they were heavily indebted. Thus the motives were varied. Everyone hastened together. No one in the West thought of age or gender, rank or status. No one adhered to agreements. Everyone, without distinction, gave their word and unanimously pledged with heart and mouth the pilgrimage. Where a prince had pledged the journey, the people flocked together in countless numbers to join his retinue. They had all agreed among themselves, and Autumn had also commanded them that those who had pledged to join the expedition should carry the blessed sign of the life-giving cross on their clothes, in remembrance of the suffering of him whose cities they wished to visit. On June 17, 1099, after a tormenting march, the Crusaders finally arrived before Jerusalem. Three years earlier, they had set out on their way and we came rejoicing with anticipation to the city of Jerusalem on Tuesday, eight days before the Ides of June, and we besieged it marvelously. However, the army suffered terribly from thirst. The surroundings of Jerusalem are very poor in water, and one finds only at a considerable distance a few small springs or wells. Even these springs had been filled in by the enemies shortly before the arrival of our troops so that they would last less long during the siege of the fortress. They had thrown earth into them or clogged them by various other means. They had also opened the cisterns and other rainwater containers or had maliciously hidden them so that the poor unfortunates tormented by thirst could not come there to seek relief. During this siege, we suffered the torment of thirst to such an extent that we sewed together ox and buffalo hides in which we fetched water from six miles away. The water that such containers supplied to us was stinking, and just as this foul water was, the barley bread was for us a daily cause of discomfort and grief. The Saracens secretly laid traps for our people by poisoning the wells and springs. They killed all they found and hid their animals in caves and grottoes, our noble lords now sought means to attack the city with the help of machines, to be able to penetrate into it and venerate the tomb of our Saviour. They built two wooden towers and not a few other machines, catapults for stones, battering rams and spear-throwing machines. Duke Godfrey set up a tower equipped with machines and Count Raymond did the same. From distant regions they had wood brought in. When the Saracens saw our people building these machines, they fortified the city admirably and reinforced the defences of the towers. On Wednesday and Thursday we launched strong attacks on the city from all sides, but before we took it by storm, the bishops and priests, through their sermons and exhortations, had us resolve that to honour God we should make a procession around the walls of Jerusalem and that it would be accompanied by prayers, alms, and fasting. On Friday, very early, we undertook a general assault on the city without being able to harm it. We were dismayed and in great fear. 
Then, when the hour came in which our Lord Jesus Christ allowed himself to suffer death on the cross for us, our knights stationed on the tower and the other lords, Godfrey and his brother Count Eustace, fought fiercely. At that moment one of our knights named Lethold climbed the city wall. Soon after he had climbed up, all the defenders fled from the walls through the city, and our people followed them and drove them before them. They killed and cut them down as far as the Temple of Solomon, where there was such a bloodbath that our people waded up to their ankles in blood. The entire temple was covered with their blood. After our people had struck down the heathens, they seized in the temple a large number of men and women and killed or spared them as they saw fit. Soon the crusaders roamed the whole city and seized gold, silver, horses and mules. They plundered the houses which were filled with riches. Then, happy and weeping for joy, our people went to venerate the tomb of our Saviour and discharged their debt of gratitude to Him. On the following day, our people climbed onto the roof of the temple, attacked the Saracens, men and women, drew the sword and cut off their heads. Some threw themselves from the height of the temple into the abyss. At this sight, Tancred was filled with indignation. Our people decided in council that everyone should give alms and pray, so that God would choose the one whom he wished to rule over the others and govern the city. They also ordered all the dead Saracens to be thrown out of the city because of the indecent stench, for the whole city was completely filled with their corpses. The living Saracens dragged the dead out of the city and made great piles. No one has ever heard or seen of a similar massacre among the heathen people. There were piles like cornerstones, and no one except God knows their number. One could not behold without horror this multitude of dead, and the sight of the victors, who were covered from head to foot with blood, was no less horrifying. Thus, on Friday, July 15th, 1099, the holy city was restored to the Christian world. So reported the eyewitnesses. There was no reason for this first crusade of Christendom in the year 1099, for this massacre of the heathens, other than the dream of an all-encompassing kingdom of God on earth under the leadership of the Pope. Around 70,000 men, women and children had been slaughtered in Jerusalem by the Christian hordes. For the Roman Church, the crusade was a complete success. The Pope had shown himself as ruler of all Christendom, as the vicar of Christ on earth. His sword had defeated the Saracens and incorporated Palestine into the kingdom of God on earth, and perhaps the Christian rule over the entire Orient could be expanded. As soon as the Holy Sepulchre was found, pious Christians now flocked there. Pilgrimages to the Holy Land became fashionable. All places that had gained special significance through the Bible became destinations for pilgrims, even the dung heap on which Job had sat. When the pilgrimage was also connected with indulgences, a true flood of pilgrims overwhelmed the Holy Land. Indulgence is a child of purgatory. In the earliest times of the Christian church, those who had been expelled from the community for gross offences and wanted to be readmitted had to publicly confess all their sins and crimes before the community. As the priests became powerful, they soon turned this public confession into a secret to increase their power. By order of the Pope, everyone was to confess their sins secretly to a priest at least once a year and bear the penance imposed upon them. Whoever neglected confession was excluded from the church and did not receive a Christian burial. Through this institution, the priests gained great power over the faithful, for they learned from them the most secret things. It was now entirely in the hands of the cleric to absolve the penitent from his guilt, and the priests knew how to use this power by absolving the sinner depending on how much he paid. Thus, one could shorten the time one had to spend in purgatory after death by buying an indulgence. Whoever made a pilgrimage to this or that place of grace and offered a certain amount of money on the altar received indulgence not only for sins already committed, but even for some years in advance. 
That was, of course, extremely tempting, for one not only got rid of one's sins, but could also combine the pilgrimage with a small side business. Relics enjoyed the greatest popularity. A relic from the Holy Land could not be weighed against gold and precious stones. However, there was a small obstacle. The relic had to be examined in Rome by order of the Pope and was only considered genuine if the owner could prove its authenticity with hard cash. A good relic was a treasure for a monastery, and every Christian altar had to have its relic and its saint. The holier it was, the greater was, in turn, the benefit one could derive from it, for viewing these relics was not free of charge. Thus, holy objects of all kinds were brought from the Holy Land. The entire wardrobe of Jesus, the Virgin Mary, Saint Joseph, and many other saints came to light. They found the holy lance with which the Roman knight Longinus had pierced Jesus in the side, the sweat cloth with which Saint Veronica had wiped Jesus' sweat as he went to Golgotha. Even an imprint of his face was to be seen on the cloth. There were so many pieces of this cloth that together they would probably be thirty meters long. They also discovered the wine jugs from the wedding at Cana, and in them was still wine that never diminished. Originally, there were only six, but they multiplied, and they were displayed in Cologne and Magdeburg, splinters of the true cross. There were so many that from the wood used one could have built a warship, and nails from the cross weighed many hundred weights. Thorns from the crown of thorns were found, some bled on every Good Friday. The chalice from which Jesus had drunk when he instituted the Last Supper was also found, along with bread that had remained from that meal. Furthermore, the dice with which the soldiers had gambled for Jesus' robe. Such seamless robes were displayed in great numbers, among others in Trier, Agen, Santiago, Rome, and Friuli, and so on. The one preserved in Moscow is said to have the greatest likelihood of authenticity, supposedly brought home by the soldier who won it, a Georgian. In Trae, even in the year 1845, an old garment was exhibited that claimed to be a robe of Jesus. The entire educated world was outraged, and there were many investigations into these holy robes. They all possessed a well-paid papal bull, attesting to their authenticity. They found shirts of Mary that were so large that they could have served a stout man as a cloak a very precious wedding ring of Mary that was shown in Perugia, very cute little slippers and a pair of enormously large red ones that she wore when she visited St. Elizabeth. Yes, they found hairs of the Holy Virgin of all possible colours along with her combs. Blood of Jesus was found sometimes drop by drop, sometimes filled in bottles. Some of it, so the legend tells, had been collected by Nicodemus when he took Jesus from the cross and performed many miracles with it. Diapers of Jesus were found in large quantities. Also, the trousers of St. Joseph were discovered, along with his carpenter's tools. One of the thirty pieces of silver, twenty, and the enormously thick four-meter-long rope on which the traitor Judas hanged himself were found. A very small, empty purse also surfaced, along with the lantern with which he illuminated the way when he betrayed Jesus. Even the rooster appeared, on which the cock crowed when Peter denied Jesus, along with some feathers of this bird. Furthermore, the stone with which the devil tempted Jesus in the desert, the basin in which Pilate washed his hands, the bones of the donkey that carried Jesus on Palm Sunday, as well as some of the palm branches used on that day. Moreover, they found the stones with which St. Stephen was stoned, splendid hairs and a multitude of bones of the children killed in Bethlehem. They even found relics from the Old Testament. Some had thus apparently waited unharmed for millennia for their pious discovery. They found the staff with which Moses parted the Red Sea, manna from the desert. Noah's beard, a piece of the rock from which Moses struck water. No, this enumeration is no joke. 
it seemed completely natural to transfer the miraculous power that emanated from a saint to all the objects with which he had ever come into contact. The entire Middle Ages are characterized by the deep belief in these powers, and one could almost say that the cult of relics was the actual religion of the Middle Ages. The people's belief in it was so strong that the clergy could dare to show things as relics that were nonsensical or impossible. Even in the 15th century, the papal private secretary Poggio Bracciolini reports the story of the Holy Trousers. A monk had fallen in love with a pretty woman and tried in every way to seduce her. He succeeded indeed. She pretended to be very ill and requested the monk as her confessor. He came and, as was customary, remained alone with her to hear her confession. The next day he returned and, to make himself more comfortable, placed his trousers on the woman's bed. The husband found the confession to be taking unusually long. Growing suspicious, he unexpectedly entered the room. The monk absolved her as quickly as possible and fled, but forgot to take his trousers with him. These fell into the hands of the vengeful husband. He rushed out into the street, showed the treacherous garment to his neighbors, incited them to rage, and stormed the monastery with them. The monk was to die. An old prudent father tried in vain to calm the hothead, who, by the way, would have preferred to hush up the matter if possible. The old father noticed this and told him there was no need to think ill of the trousers, for they were the breeches of St. Francis, which thoroughly healed illnesses like the one his wife was suffering from. To reassure him, he offered to ceremoniously retrieve the trousers. Immediately, monks with cross and banner proceeded to the house of the honest fool, placed the holy relic on a silk cushion, displayed it for veneration, and passed around the holy trousers of the dissolute monk for the faithful to kiss. Then they carried them back to the monastery in a solemn procession and placed them with the other holy relics. This story is no joke. It is found in a very serious work in which Poggio Bracciolini reports with great indignation about the corruption of the clergy. But the Crusades not only had a great influence on the trade in relics, their impact on the entire Western world can hardly be overstated. Seven times the Christian armies invaded the Holy Land, until finally, on May 18th, 1291, the last bastion of Christendom, Acre, had to be surrendered. During this time, trade with the Orient truly took off, and the trading cities grew, becoming rich and powerful. The city of Pisa had participated in the siege of Jerusalem under the command of its archbishop with 120 ships and secured a colony in Jaffa as a result. Genoa was also involved in the First Crusade, receiving settlements in Antioch in return, which promised good business. Venice threatened to miss out. It had not participated in the First Crusade, but now, a year after the conquest of Jerusalem, the Venetian trading fleet anchored in Jaffa with 200 ships. The merchants sensed the immense riches of the East and thus began the golden age of the great trading cities, Another effect of the Crusades, which neither popes nor emperors could have foreseen, would, over the next centuries, shatter the medieval worldview, the direct contact with the highly developed Arab culture. Even if there had been points of contact in earlier times, especially through Arab possessions in Spain and southern Italy, from now on, new knowledge began to spread, particularly in the fields of science, medicine and mathematics. This battle the Roman Church would not win, even if it fought against it with the sword of the Inquisition, with torture and with the fires of the stake. After the first barbaric crusade in July 1099, the Christian hordes indulged in an exceedingly reprehensible lifestyle in the Holy Land. One of the crusaders, Hugues de Payens, a nobleman from Champagne who was then just 19 years old, returned to France in horror. With his uncle, Count of Champagne, he travelled again to Jerusalem in 1104. For five years, the two searched there for ancient writings. 
Back in France, they handed over the discovered documents to the Cistercian Order for evaluation and interpretation. It was evidently significant what they had found, for in 1114 they travelled again to the Holy Land to bring back further mysterious writings. The Cistercian monks were likely very helpful with their translation and interpretation work, for the Count of Champagne donated a large piece of land to the order and commissioned the founding of the Abbey of Clairvaux. A young, zealous man was to lead it, Bernard of Fontaine. He would make a name for himself as Bernard of Clairvaux or Saint Bernard, and he would become the soul of the Second Crusade to the Holy Land. Four years later, that crusader of the first hour, Hugh de Payan, together with seven other men, including two Cistercian monks, founded the Order of the Knights Templar. Bernard of Clairvaux had contributed to the drafting of their rule and soon praised the aims of the order. Free from the pursuit of wealth and in complete devotion to God, the Templars saw their task as protecting pilgrims from attacks by Saracens and highwaymen. Strange, however, was that upon their founding, they vowed not to recruit new members for nine years. They took up quarters in Jerusalem in the palace of King Baldwin, which stood on the ruins of Solomon's temple. Yet at that time, they did not participate in any battles. Instead, they undertook archaeological excavations in the vicinity and within the area of Solomon's temple. What they were searching for and perhaps found there remains a mystery to this day. Speculations range from the Ark of the Covenant to the Holy Grail to writings from the time of Christ that could give faith an entirely new content. Or was it King Solomon's treasure? Whatever they may have discovered in Jerusalem, nowhere else in the world does one come so close to the foundational mysteries of the three Abrahamic religions. Christianity, Judaism and Islam have their origins here. When British officers in 1894 created a map of the underground passages and vaults of this area, they repeatedly encountered traces of the Templars. Since its founding, the order had always been shrouded in mystery. No one could say where their wealth came from. Their riches suddenly grew immensely, and their influence on politics increased. In 1139, the Pope granted them the right to build their own churches and to levy their own taxes. No other secular power was allowed to interfere in their actions. They became the actual lords of Jerusalem and a commercial power throughout the Mediterranean. The First Crusade had proven that it was possible to acquire property and power. The conquest of the Holy Land had opened up new dimensions for trade. When in 1144 the city of Edessa in Mesopotamia was recaptured by the Saracens, the Pope saw the holy sites of Palestine threatened anew and prepared for the Second Crusade. The cities of Genoa, Pisa and Venice were already waiting to get involved, hoping it would once again become an extremely profitable venture. The populace was initially not very enthusiastic. Along the Rhine, the monk Radulfa preached for the crusade, but he only succeeded in inciting the people in several cities against the Jews, whom they accused of usury. But now another warrior of God ascended the pulpits at the behest of the Pope. Bernard of Clairvaux had left his monastic cell and, like a blazing torch, travelled through the lands, igniting in the hearts of the faithful the joy of sacrifice. First he worked in France, where King Louis VII, along with numerous knights, pledged to journey to the Holy Land. Then he proceeded through Flanders to Germany. His mere appearance, the gaunt figure emaciated by pious exercises and the countenance illuminated by a holy glow, was enough to evoke a true frenzy of devotion wherever he preached. People believed they were witnessing miracles and followed him blindly. Even the German ruler, Conrad III, took the cross and set out with an army of 60,000 men. All had followed the call of the Pope and St. Bernard, even the rulers of the two most powerful realms of Europe, Louis VII of France and Conrad III of Germany. A massive army left Europe, but the crusade turned into a terrible failure with huge losses. 
Only the King of France could console himself over his misfortune. He had succeeded in purchasing, for an enormous sum, some splinters of the true cross, a few nails, the sponge, the purple robe of Jesus, and the crown of thorns. When these relics arrived, he went barefoot with his entire court to meet them at Vézelay. It seemed as if finally all of Europe had succumbed to a religious frenzy under the splendor of the Roman Church, and men like Bernard of Clairvaux had perhaps the greatest share in it. Bernard came from an old, noble Burgundian family. He was an enthusiast who earnestly sought to reform the corrupt clergy and people in general. He tormented his body in dreadful ways, often living with his monks only on beech leaves and miserable barley bread. Once, to strengthen his weakened stomach, he enjoyed some flour mixed with oil and honey. Then he wept bitterly over this weakness. His piety and sharp intellect soon earned him a significant reputation. Once in Milan, his hands and arms were swollen from the kisses with which intrusive believers covered him. He could have become an archbishop or even pope. He declined all positions, but as the simple brother Bernard of Clairvaux exerted the most significant influence. He settled disputes between popes and kings, between princes and their defiant vassals, and the fiercest warrior trembled before the mighty monk. Neither emperor nor pope dared to enter Bernard's monastery armed, they went humbly on foot. Out of conviction and religious zeal, he supported the Second Crusade, this great work, as some historians call it. His eloquence triumphed even over the most stubborn opponents. The German ruler Conrad III was initially completely disinclined to join the crusade, but after hearing Berner's sermon in Speyer, he took off his royal mantle and carried the saint on his shoulders through the crowd. Bernard's seductive tongue depopulated the cities of men so that in some, barely one man remained for seven women. For everything that has vigour took the cross, lamented one who stayed behind. Between Bernard of Clairvaux and the Order of the Knights Templar, there must have been some connections. Not only did he assist in drafting the Order's rules, but he also obtained papal recognition of the Order in 1128, but then their paths seemed to have diverged. Bernard remained true to his convictions of asceticism and poverty and became a saint. The order of the temple became surprisingly wealthy. Soon people spoke of the legendary Templar treasure. An aura of secret knowledge and hidden power surrounded the Templars. They were said to possess profound knowledge in architecture, and the immense Gothic cathedrals that arose in the following century are primarily attributed to their expertise. This knowledge undoubtedly originated from Arab culture. The construction of the Cathedral of Chartres took only 26 years from planning to completion. Within this time, carpenters, glaziers, sculptors, geodesists, and astronomers created such an incomprehensible masterpiece that every visitor who enters the church inevitably succumbs to its fascination. The proportions are so perfect that the entire structure seems weightless. Wherever one looks, one discovers meaningful panels and stained glass images that defy any deciphering. What secrets might the builders have hidden here? Chartres is just one of 80 gigantic Gothic monumental buildings that arose in that century in France, following the return of the Templars from the Holy Land. The end of the order is as mysterious as its beginning. Gradually, it became clear that the Templars were also going their own way in matters of faith. Pope Clement V could not tolerate this. He allied himself with the French king, Philip IV, who owed the Order of the Temple a great deal of money. At dawn, on October 13, 1307, the merciless hunt for all members of the Order began. The goal was to arrest all Templars in France and confiscate their properties. The number of Templars in all of France was estimated at about 15,000 men. Many managed to flee to Spain, Portugal and Scotland, but most were captured and imprisoned. Those who did not die in the torture chamber burned at the stake. However, the legendary Templar treasure remained missing. 
but it would not be long before a new movement emerged from Scotland into the world, that of the Freemasons. To this day it is said that they secretly pull the strings of world events. Are they the heirs of the Knights Templar? At the time of the Crusades, the papacy was at the peak of its power. At the behest of the Holy Father, all of Europe went to war. Mercilessly, the Christian warriors slew the enemy or were themselves slaughtered or died on the way to the Holy Land from hunger, disease, and exhaustion. That the men on Peter's throne succumbed to the intoxication of power is human, but the moral decadence of the Catholic clergy had nothing more to do with religion or even with God. Disappointment spread among the faithful, and the ideal of Christian conduct, as embodied by St. Bernard, gained importance. Bernard remained loyal to the papacy throughout his life, but did not fail to repeatedly criticize the secular hunger for power and the unbridled behavior of the church rulers. They did not hold this against him and canonized him as early as 1173. The turn toward ascetic ideals took new forms. In 1182, St. Francis of Assisi was born as Giovanni Bernardone. The idea of mendicant orders is his achievement. The son of a wealthy merchant from Assisi in Umbria did not want to follow in his father's footsteps, so he became a soldier. He fell into captivity and became seriously ill there. After his recovery, he mingled with beggars and lepers, kissed their sores, dressed in rags, and stole from his father to use the stolen goods to rebuild a dilapidated church. The Bishop of Assisi took him under his protection, and soon he roamed the country begging for the construction of the aforementioned church. The collection was so plentiful that he came up with the idea of founding a mendicant order. Pope Innocent III, prompted by a dream, confirmed the monastic rule drawn up by Francis, which he had initially called a rule for pigs, not for men. The next pope, Honorius III, was also not particularly enthusiastic. You are a simpleton, he said, but he allowed the simpleton to proceed. At first Francis was mocked and ridiculed, but after three or four years his reputation for holiness grew so much that when he approached a town the clergy and people would come out to meet him solemnly, and all the bells would ring. When he walked around Assisi and begged, he put all the edible things he received into a pot. When he was hungry, he would reach in and eat from the unpleasant mixture. Once Francis was invited to dinner by a cardinal. He left all the dishes untouched and, to the general disgust of the distinguished guests, ate the scraps he had collected. Alms are our inheritance, alms our righteousness, begging our purpose and our royal dignity, shame and contempt, our honor and our glory on the day of judgment. That was his motto, and he led by good example. The more the street boys mocked him, the happier he was. He was quite pleased when they even threw dirt at him. Out of sheer humility, he let himself be trampled underfoot. He loved animals very much and called them his brothers and sisters. Often he preached to the geese, ducks, and chickens. Once, when the swallows and sparrows disturbed him with their chirping, he asked the dear sisters for silence. A farmer who was carrying two lambs to market, he asked, why do you torment my brothers so? A louse that had strayed onto his robe he carefully took between his fingers, kissed it and said, Dear sister louse, praise the Lord with me, then placed it back on his head where it had come from. He called his body Brother Donkey, and when this donkey was pricked by oats, meaning when he felt bodily desires, he tormented it vigorously. He rolled naked on thorns, waded up to his neck in frozen ponds, or lay in the snow until every lustful donkey-like urge had disappeared. His order grew extraordinarily fast. Already in the year 1216, when he convened a general chapter in Assisi, five thousand Franciscans gathered there. Over time, the Franciscan monasteries became as wealthy as none other, riches through poverty, a surprising combination. 
In France, since the First Crusade, a new religious community had formed as a reaction to the moral decadence of the Catholic clergy, the Cathars. Cathar comes from the Greek katharos and means pure. The Catholics use the term with a derogatory tone, proud ones who call themselves pure. The Cathars themselves called themselves believers, Christians, the priests even good Christians. The term perfect for a Cathar priest was only used by the inquisitors of the Roman Church, of course, ironically. The Cathars sought to free the divine spark trapped in their bodies. Since they interpreted the Bible in their own way, they stood in complete opposition to the Roman Church. They even denied the divinity of Christ. For them he was only a man, though an exemplary one. The holy sacrament of baptism was meaningless to them, and they were pacifists, opponents of war. That had not existed in the Roman Church for over a thousand years. The Pope could not possibly tolerate this, especially at a time when, at his behest, all of Europe was taking up arms. Bernard of Clairvaux had already tried to convert the Cathars, or Albigensians, as they were also called, to the true faith. Given his limited success, the Third Lateran Council in 1179 decided to take decisive action against this heresy. Three papal envoys arrived in southern French Occitania. Here, the tradition of troubadours flourished, which might have confused the holy Peter. The troubadours sang the high praise of women. Even though women were considered vessels of the devil, sources of sin, dens of lust, houses of the old enemy. From the word Cathar now came the term heretic. The papal legate Pierre de Castelnau was murdered. To this day, it's unknown whether he was eliminated by the Cathars or by secret assassins of the Pope. In any case, that was the occasion to proceed with armed force against the devilish heresy. In March 1208, Pope Innocent III called for a crusade against the Albigensians. Knights from all over France, from Flanders and Burgundy, from Bavaria, Austria and Friesland, followed the call. The Holy War would last more than twenty years, and the number of victims is estimated at one million. Dominic Guzman, one of the three papal legates, recognized that the Roman Church lacked a suitable instrument to combat unbelief within its own ranks, promptly and effectively. And so he founded the Order of the Dominicans, the order focused on preaching and teaching the true faith, censoring dangerous books, and persecuting the believers, the heretics. On papal commission, the Holy Inquisition now came into play, and Dominic himself was the first to formally conduct heretic hunts. The painful questioning, also known as torture, was the instrument for finding the truth. The stake was the judgment. Dominic wanted to unite his order with that of St. Francis, but Francis had no desire for it. Both orders initially supported each other, but soon they fell into bitter enmity. On one hand, the educated Dominicans always wanted to be somewhat better than the Franciscans, from whom no slowness was demanded. On the other hand, the Dominican order was a mendicant order like that of the Franciscans, and even envy came into play. Dominic Guzman died in 1221, and already thirteen years later he was canonized, for his services to the Roman Church were enormous. With the Holy Inquisition, the tool was created to literally suppress heresy forcefully. In those times of crusades and holy wars against heretics, there were also people who deserved the word holy much more. Often it was women who, in the rigid patriarchy and the megalomania of the papacy, struck gentle notes and mostly withdrew into a convent to devote themselves to mystical contemplation. Their mild halo shines into our time. One such woman is the Benedictine nun Hildegard of Bingen. Her knowledge of medicinal herbs and medicine enjoys renewed attention, especially in our days. Under the term Hildegard Medicine, you can find her recipes in some pharmacies when conventional medicine has reached its limits. 
Whoever suffers heartache so that his heart's strength makes no progress but becomes sad should often eat the raw kernels of chestnuts, and it is as if he imbues his heart with a glaze and he attains strength and cheerfulness. Through her observation of nature, she recognized humans as holistic beings, as an interplay of mind and body. From head to toe, she tried to track down illnesses, dealt with walking and standing and riding, with nutrition and digestion, with emotions and metabolic disorders, and gave instructions for a healthy lifestyle. Fear, anger, or even excessive joy can make it difficult for a person to fall asleep. Only when he brings his emotional state into harmony with his affairs do the vessels regain the right balance. Then the person falls asleep. The day behind the monastery walls began at 3 a.m. with the night service, following the rule of St. Benedict. Ora et labora. Pray and work. Between the short hours of prayer, they worked in the garden and in the field, the night prayer shortly after sunset ended the day. Here is a prayer from Hildegard's pen for those who find no edification in the Christian litanies. When I look with open eyes at what you, my God, have created, I already possess heaven here, quietly, matter-of-factly, in the lap of roses and lilies and all greenery, while your works praise you. Hildegard's first great work, Scivia's Know the Ways, established her reputation as a mystic and seer and reached the highest church circles. In the year 1141 of the Incarnation of Jesus Christ, when I was 42 years and seven months old, I saw a very strong sparkling light coming from the open heaven. It penetrated my brain, my heart, my breast entirely like a flame that does not burn but warms. It ignited me as the sun warms an object upon which it pours its rays. And suddenly I had insight into the meaning and interpretation of the Psalter, the Gospel, and the other writings of the Old and New Testaments. This vision I receive not in dreamlike states, not in sleep or as one disturbed in mind, not with the eyes of the body and not in secluded places, but awake and alert and with a clear mind, with the eyes and ears of the inner person in publicly accessible places as God wills it. I heard a voice from heaven say, I am the living light that illuminates the darkness. Hildegard of Bingen is considered the greatest mystic of the Middle Ages. Here, in the middle of the 12th century, you can already sense how a new era is casting its shadows ahead, how new thinking is gradually making space. In Italy, the first universities are emerging, but mainly Christian doctrines are being taught. Philosophy enjoys great esteem among scholars. To philosophize at this time means to prove the preached truths as cleverly as possible. Alongside stands mysticism, which is nourished by inner contemplation of God. At the same time, new religious communities are forming, the Cathars and the Waldensians, and the Roman Church responds with harsh measures, with the sword and the fire of the Holy Inquisition. The Pope is more powerful than ever before. The omnipotence over the entire world is within reach, thanks to the great success of the First Crusade. But the failure of the Christian armies in the Second Crusade turns the tide once again. The senseless dying of the Crusaders in Asia Minor and Palestine was blamed on the authors of the ill-fated enterprise. The disappointment over the great futile sacrifice fell back on those who had demanded it and had promoted it with a thousand beautiful words. While the Roman Church visibly lost ground in its worldly power expansion, a new ruler was elected in Germany in the year 1152, Frederick Barbarossa. He once again took up the fight against the worldly supremacy of the Pope. But the powers that the Curia had appropriated over the centuries were now so firmly established that one could hardly expect more than a brief flare-up of the old imperial glory. The time when emperors could still permanently rule over the Church was finally over, and to rule in agreement with the Pope, that was unthinkable. 
But now the situation seemed favorable, the papacy was weakened and had to deal with uprisings in Rome, and the new German king Frederick I, also called Barbarossa due to his reddish beard, was finally a ruler of stature. As a fervent admirer of Charlemagne, he, like him, strove for supremacy over the Roman Church. The idea of the kingdom of God on earth, under the leadership of the emperor, came alive once more. And so it was Frederick Barbarossa who eagerly pursued the canonization of Charlemagne. But the new blossoming of the empire would last only half a century. The secular princes stood behind the new king, and Frederick quickly knew how to assert himself against the princes of the church. He demanded obedience from them and imposed strict punishments where necessary. He knew how to place men who were well disposed toward him and remained loyal in vacant positions. He seized the movable property of deceased church princes. In short, he began to treat the high clergy again as a royal instrument. In 1153, a treaty was concluded in Constance between king and pope. Both promised each other help against their enemies, and Pope Eugene III held out the prospect of the imperial crown to Frederick. A year later, it was time. Frederick crossed the Alps with a modest force of 1-800 knights. Adrian IV, who had become Pope in the meantime, was in dire straits. The Roman citizens, remembering the ancient Roman Empire, had elected a Senate that disputed the Pope's sole rule in the Holy City. In addition, in Rome and in Lombardy, a certain Arnold of Brescia was inciting the people with fiery, provocative speeches against the Pope. True piety forbids any possession. The Church must therefore dispossess itself of all goods, he preached openly. He also opposed the prevailing practice of the Inquisition, which without proper trial and without the possibility of defence, sent the accused to the stake. On the way to Rome, Frederick Barbarossa captured the troublemaker and handed him over to the Pope, who promptly had him executed. But Pope Adrian IV demanded an even more painful service from the German king. Barbarossa had to take on the role of a stable boy and hold the Pope's stirrup. He did this only after strong resistance and only because the older knights in his entourage convinced him that the same had already happened under the last emperor. Barbarossa held the stirrup for the Pope, but he held it on the right side, on which a child mounts a horse and replied to Adrian's remark about it. I was never a stable boy. Your Holiness will forgive. Yes, the imperial title was now associated with great humiliation. After the coronation, Emperor Frederick Barbarossa withdrew again, even though the Romans once again attempted an uprising. The Pope had to help himself. Was that a small revenge for a great humiliation? But 1-800 German armoured knights were not enough to restore lasting peace in Rome. True, the knights were of fearsome appearance. By now, even the horses wore chain armor. But it was probably not much more than an armed demonstration. Under Emperor Frederick Barbarossa's rule, the German Empire now flourished splendidly as it hadn't for a long time. To restore it to its former glory, Frederick resorted to old regulations and customs that had fallen into oblivion or were no longer practiced due to changed circumstances but he was far from realizing his dream of building a world empire like Charlemagne's. Three years later, conflict flared up again between the emperor and the pope. At a lavish imperial assembly held by Barbarossa, two papal legates appeared and delivered a letter of complaint from the church authorities. Among various accusations, it suggested that the imperial dignity was a fief under papal supremacy. This led to an uproar among the German followers of the emperor. One legate interjected, From whom does he have the empire if not from the Lord Pope? This renewed papal humiliation struck deep. The following year, an imperial army of more than 10,000 men crossed the Alps. Brescia surrendered. Milan was forced to open its gates. 
the papal power had increasingly relied on the cities of northern Italy. Now they had to return all imperial estates they had acquired over time, and only those lands for which they could provide proper documentation were granted to them. Moreover, imperial envoys roamed the papal territories, checking for old rights of the crown. Just at this time, the Pope died. The cardinals split into two camps, for and against Barbarossa, and two popes were elected. The church princes from Germany and Lombardy chose Pope Victor IV. The others elevated Alexander III to the papacy, the same legate who had delivered the humiliating letter at Barbarossa's assembly. The ensuing conflict between Alexander III and the emperor lasted almost twenty years. Pope Alexander fled to France and tried to form an international alliance against the emperor. Barbarossa razed Milan to the ground. Alexander III returned to Rome. The emperor appeared with his army in the holy city and installed his own pope on the throne. Alexander III fled once more. Then a treacherous plague swept away the imperial army. Now it was Barbarossa who fled homeward by secret paths with the remnants of his troops, knowing he couldn't show himself so weakened in the northern Italian cities. In the meantime, those cities had formed the Lombard League to throw off the imperial yoke. Barbarossa had enough of Italy for a while. Only six years later did he cross the Alps again with 8,000 knights. The Lombard League negotiated a peace with the emperor. Barbarossa sent most of his army home, convinced he had secured his rule in northern Italy. But the cities had no intention of keeping their agreements now that the emperor's military power was weakened. Conflict erupted. The emperor suffered a bitter defeat against the superior forces of Milan, which wanted revenge for the destruction of their city. Now, Barbarossa had no choice but to make peace with Pope Alexander III. When the two met in Venice in 1177 and the emperor kissed the pope's foot, church writers say Pope Alexander pressed his foot on the emperor's neck with the words, You shall tread upon serpents and scorpions and over young lions and dragons. The emperor's scribes recorded Barbarossa's words, Not to you, but to Peter. The pope is said to have replied, Both to me and to Peter. It seems Barbarossa was not ready to accept his defeat. He married his son to the heiress of the Normans, ruling in southern Italy, and granted him the title of Caesar at the wedding. Now he was in a position to squeeze the Pope. With control over southern Italy, he might have had other hopes, perhaps to participate in lucrative ventures in the East. This might explain why, at the age of sixty, he set out with 20,000 men on a crusade to the Holy Land. He would not return. In Asia Minor, he achieved one last victory and then drowned in the floods. An era came to an end. The era of the great European empires was over. There would be no ruler who could compare himself to Charlemagne or Otto the Great. The victory of the papacy was becoming evident, although some kings and emperors still opposed it but the tide was turning irrevocably. Boniface Feast came to the papal throne in 1294. In his decree, it reads, We declare, say, define, and decide that every human creature is subject to the Pope, and that one cannot be saved without believing this. Pope Boniface also introduced the Jubilee year to the faithful Christians. Ancient Rome celebrated the beginning of a new century with great festivities. The Jews had their jubilee or atonement year. This gave the Pope the idea to introduce such jubilee years in Christianity. Whoever made a pilgrimage to Rome during the jubilee year and offered donations at the altar received full indulgence for all sins committed in their life and became as innocent as a newborn child or even more innocent, since, according to church teaching, a newborn already carries original sin, which is only erased through baptism. Sinners flocked to Rome from all sides. In the year 1300, there were about 200,000. The profit for both the Romans and the papal church was immense, 
the offerings of gold and silver from the wealthy were kept secret by the papal treasury. In copper coins alone, they collected 50,000 gold gulden in this golden year. Estimates put the total proceeds of the Jubilee year at 15 million, a truly extraordinary sum for that time. This unexpectedly rich harvest made the popes eager for a quicker repetition. A hundred years was too long, so Pope Clement VI had the unprecedented kindness to decree that the next Jubilee year would be celebrated in fifty years. He claimed that an elderly man with two keys, probably St. Peter, had appeared to him, urging him to open the gates. Naturally, he had to obey. In the Jubilee Bull, the Pope commands the angels of heaven to release from purgatory those who died on the journey to Rome and lead them into the joys of paradise. At the altar of St. Paul, two priests took turns day and night, raking in the offered money, nearly collapsing under the weight of their work. The crowd in the church was so large that many of the faithful were crushed. The number of pilgrims was estimated at over a million and the proceeds of this jubilee harvest exceeded 22 million. In memory of the years of Jesus' life, Pope Urban VI shortened the time between jubilee years to 33 years, so he could enjoy it himself in 1383. Due to the shortness of human life, the interval was later reduced to 25 years. In 1389, Pope Boniface IX calculated that many Christians didn't come to Rome because the journey was too costly or they couldn't leave their affairs. So he sent out people empowered to grant valid indulgences for a third of the travel cost to Rome. Despite this relief offer, foreigners continued to flock to the Holy City. During the Jubilee year under Nicholas V, who reigned from 1447 to 1455, the Tiber Bridge couldn't bear the multitude of people and collapsed. Two hundred believers lost their lives. Meanwhile, governing became increasingly difficult for secular rulers. There was not only the Pope in Rome claiming supremacy over the entire world, but also a new power growing in the cities, the middle class, which gradually replaced the old feudal system piece by piece. The pioneers were the cities of Lombardy. When they united in the Lombard League and successfully defied Emperor Barbarossa, the historian Otto von Freising wrote about them, for they love freedom so much that they withdraw from any overreach of power and prefer to be governed by consuls rather than rulers since they have three estates, capitalists, nobles, and citizens, to prevent arrogance, these consuls are elected not from one, but from all estates. To avoid them becoming tyrannical, they are replaced every year. Thus, the land is almost entirely divided into city-states, and one hardly finds a noble or ambitious man who does not submit to this rule of the cities. To ensure they have the means to defend themselves and not oppress their neighbors, they do not consider it beneath them to admit young people of the lower classes and even artisans, practicing some despised mechanical trade to knighthood and its honors. As a result, they surpass other cities of the world in wealth and power. It didn't take long before the example of the Italians spread across Europe. City air makes one free after a year and a day was a saying of those days that attracted rural populations. Any serf could move to the city and after 366 days was free, no longer able to be reclaimed by their former lord. As a free citizen, they enjoyed the city's protection and could pursue an independent profession, engage in trade or earn a living as a craftsman. With the old market rights that cities usually possessed came the supervision of measures and weights, minting and customs rights, and the right to self-defense. Some cities even fought for the right of high jurisdiction. In Germany, the great Rhenish City League followed the Italian example. Mainz, Worms, and Oppenheim swore mutual assistance against any external threat. The Swiss Confederation of the Three Original Cantons Uri, Schwitz, and Unterwalden, was soon joined by Lucerne, Zurich, and Bern. Their union endures to this day. 
A new era had begun. The Crusades had broken the boundaries of medieval Europe. While the Holy Land had to be ceded back to the Saracens, the gain in knowledge from the Arab world was undeniable, and trade with distant eastern countries brought great wealth to many cities. But with the highly valued goods from the Far East came the Black Death. Matteo Villani, a chronicler in Florence, reported in 1346. In this year, a plague began to spread among people of all ages and sexes in the East, in China, North India, and other regions. They began to spit blood. Some died immediately, others after two or three days. The disease came in waves, affecting one nation after another, and within a year, a third of the continent called Asia. Eventually, it reached the peoples by the Black Sea. Unease began to spread in Genoa, which had a trading post called Kaffa on the Crimean Peninsula in the Black Sea. Kaffa was under siege by the Tatars, but ships still reached the harbour. Perhaps they could come to terms with the Tatars, or the siege would end. A young notary from Piacenza, Gabriele de Mussi, was in Kaffa at that time. After his safe return, he reported, At this time, the Tatars besieged the city. Their entire army panicked, and thousands died daily. To the besieged, it seemed as if arrows of vengeance flew from heaven to curb the arrogance of the enemies. Weakened by battle and plague, the Tatars realized they were doomed. They loaded corpses onto catapults and hurled them into the city, hoping everyone inside would perish from the unbearable disease. The Christians couldn't defend themselves against the corpses thrown in, nor could they remove them or flee. Their only hope was to dump the bodies into the sea as quickly as possible. But soon, the air and water were contaminated. The stench was so overwhelming that of thousands, only one was able to leave the city and escape. Thus, some ships from the mentioned city of Kaffa, steered by two sailors who were still alive but already infected with the disease, reached Genoa. Others went to Venice and others to other regions of Christendom. It sounds unbelievable. Hardly had the sailors gone ashore when the disease accompanied them. Whoever came into contact with them died. That's how the plague came to Europe. The port city of Genoa was one of the largest cities on the continent. But now the Black Death harvested richly. Soon the city government couldn't make binding decisions anymore because most council members had fallen victim to the disease. According to de Mussi's reports, only one in seven survived. Many Genoese fled, bringing the plague inland. Unstoppably, the devastating disease spread through Europe. From Venice, Lorenzo de Monacis reported, right at the beginning, the plague swept away leading figures, judges and officials within a few days, those elected to the Great Council, and then those who replaced them. In May, it increased so much and became so contagious that squares, courtyards, burial grounds and cemeteries overflowed with corpses. Many were buried along public roads, some under the floors of their houses. Countless died without anyone present, and their bodies rotted in abandoned homes. No natural flame could consume fatty things close together as this plague condemned and infected everything nearby. No one who stayed with a dying person could escape death. Simply breathing the air around the sick filled everything with an inescapable, deadly contagion. Parents, children, siblings, neighbors and friends abandoned each other to their fate. Doctors no longer visited patients, but fled. A merchant ship that was turned away in Genoa anchored in Marseille. Now the plague also reached France. The medical faculty in Paris prepared an expert report on the epidemic. We, the members of the Medical College of Paris, hereby present, after careful consideration and thorough discussion of the prevailing deadly plague, and after researching the opinions of our ancient teachers, a clear analysis of this disease according to the rules of astrology and natural sciences. We declare the following. It is known that in India and the lands by the great sea, the stars which struggle with the sun's rays and the heat of the heavenly fire, 
exert their influence especially on the sea and fight fiercely against its waters. In the process vapors arise that darken the sun and turn its light into darkness. These vapors form a cycle of rising and falling over twenty-eight days. Eventually, the sun and its fire act so strongly on the sea that they attract a large amount of it and transform it into vapor which rises into the air. If somewhere the water is spoiled by dead fish, it can no longer be dissolved by the sun's warmth and cannot be transformed into beneficial vapor, hail, snow, or ice. But the vapors spread in the air and fill some regions with poisonous winds. Thus it happened in Arabia, parts of India, in the plains and valleys of Macedonia, in Albania, Hungary, Sicily, and Sardinia, where no human remained alive. We believe that the stars, with a sense for nature, strive through their heavenly power to preserve the human race and free it from its suffering. With the help of the sun and the power of its fire, they will break through the dense clouds within ten days by July 17th. The fog will then turn into a poisonous rain. After the air becomes clean again, as soon as thunder and hail announce it, everyone must expect precipitation and avoid contact with the air during the rain. Afterwards, one should light large fires made of vine branches, laurel twigs, or other still green wood. Furthermore, burn much incense and calamus in public places and at home. No one should enter the fields before they have become completely dry. For three days, one should also eat little food and guard against the coolness of the morning, evening, and night. When it became clear that the medical predictions did not come true, people began to consider other possible causes. Strangers were viewed with great suspicion, and in Narbonne, a judge declared that men with suspicious powder had been arrested. They had partly voluntarily, partly under torture, confessed to poisoning. They were presumably paid by the English for their misdeeds, and were therefore pinched with tongs, dismembered, and finally burned. There had to be a cause for this plague that threatened to wipe out the entire human race. Some believed they noticed that young and beautiful people were preferentially victims of the plague. Talaventi, Mario the personal physician of the Pope, had yet another theory. In Avignon, the Spaniards died first because they were dirty and ate a lot of meat, which produces a lot of blood that easily goes into putrefaction when present in large quantities. Then, because they lived immorally and came from already infected areas to Avignon, they got infected. Finally, the Jews also died because they lived in unhygienic conditions and had stayed in another region where, due to the particularities and the climate of the area, a deadly plague raged. For this reason, those weakened by physical labor, such as peasants, also died. During their work, they necessarily inhale a lot of contaminated air. They fall ill because they are exposed day and night under the open sky to the air they breathe. Further reasons why most people fall ill and die during epidemic times are fear, and all the impressions caused by frequent bell ringing, death chants, and seeing the sick, one observes how everyone is visited by death. In many cities, the bells were no longer rung, and funeral processions through the city were forbidden. Pope Clement VI avoided contact with the outside world. No one had access to his chambers. He continuously had large fires maintained. He gave instructions to dissect plague victims to investigate the disease. They found what they were looking for. Rotten bodily fluids, putrefaction of the internal organs caused by an excess of moist, warm blood. Bloodletting is the only possible therapy. The diagnoses were undoubtedly very learned, but were they correct? Of course, people did not know at the time that rats and fleas transmitted the disease, and both were abundant everywhere, that a deadly breath emanated from the sick, especially when the lungs were affected, was beyond doubt, so the few doctors who had not fled from the plague tried to protect themselves with plague masks. In the beak-shaped container in front of the nose and mouth, 
They placed strips soaked in vinegar or other essences, but there was no remedy against the plague. Everything that was tried was in vain. The plague was God's punishment, and doing penance seemed the only solution. And hadn't Pope Clement VI called for a pilgrimage to Rome for the second jubilee year in the history of Christianity, long before anyone could suspect the plague? That was a sign from God. And so the faithful flocked to Rome in droves in the plague year 1350, prayed, did their penance, and also brought the plague to regions that had been spared until then. But for many, a pilgrimage was not enough. It seemed that the prophecies of the apocalypse were being fulfilled. The end of the world was near. While some squandered their fortunes to gain as much as possible from life, the penitent gathered for processions. They wanted to emulate the suffering of Christ and scourge themselves as he was scourged. They moved from city to city and often also brought the plague with them. Each carried scourges hanging down and they sang their song. This penitential journey is to be had. Christ himself went to Jerusalem and carried his cross in his hand. Now may the Saviour help us. They had two or three lead singers to whom they responded. When they entered churches, they closed them, took off their garments down to the undergarment, so that from the loins to the ankles they wore only linen. During the procession, they walked in two rows around the church and churchyard, singing, and each participant struck himself with his scourge up to the armpits so that the blood flowed over the ankles. They carried crosses, candles, and banners ahead, and during the procession they sang, Step forward, we who want to do penance, so we escape the hot hell. Lucifer is a wicked fellow. Whoever he can seize, he plunges into misery. Each scourge was a kind of stick from which three cords with large knots hung down at the front. Through the knots ran crossing iron needles from both sides, sharp spikes that protruded the length of a grain of wheat or a bit more from the knot. With such scourges, they struck themselves on the bare upper body so that it turned blue, swelled up and became disfigured and the blood ran down and splashed onto the adjacent walls of the church where they scourged themselves. Sometimes they drove the iron spikes so deep into the flesh that they could only be pulled out after repeated attempts. A penitential journey lasted thirty-three and a half days, corresponding to the years of Christ's life. Up to one hundred thousand believers are said to have participated in some of these collective frenzies, and it was not always peaceful. The chronicler Caspar Caroli documented the arrival of the flagellants in the imperial city of Frankfurt in the year 1349. When the sect of the flagellants swarmed in large numbers throughout Germany, its cities and places, a very large number of them also came to Frankfurt. When they saw here how the Jews lived in the best quarters, they were, I dare not say whether rightly, so outraged that they wanted to avenge the dishonor of our Lord, take up arms, and fight. A tumult developed during which the Jews were massacred. In vain did the citizens advocate for the safety and security of the Jews. The flagellants stormed into their houses, attacked them, and the Jews who hurried to arms were slaughtered. The alarm bell rang, and the citizenry defended them. Thanks to their strength and courage, the Jews, most had fallen victim to the sword, not without considerable bloodshed, were given back their peace. But as if the excesses against them had happened with the knowledge or even the will of the city fathers and citizens, they began to behave extremely suspiciously and plotted revenge not only against some, but against all citizens. The Jews were a persecuted people. Already at the Fourth Lateran Council in the year 1215, they had been condemned by Pope Innocent III for their supposed murder of Christ to eternal servitude. Since then, every Jew from the age of seven had to wear the pointed Jewish hat as a sign. Many professions were denied to them, so many earned their living as moneylenders, a trade forbidden to Christians. Envy, jealousy, and suspicion accompanied them. When people now sought culprits for the terrible plague, they were the first victims. 
the canon of Constance, Heinrich von Diesenhofen reported, In this year, from the Feast of St. John until All Saints' Day, the Jews were burned and killed throughout all of Burgundy, with the exception of the city of Avignon, which the Pope administered all the way to Solothurn, where they were also killed, because they were blamed for the deadly plague that raged in this and the following year. It was told and heard, even they confessed it themselves, that they had poisoned the wells, as can also be seen from the records of the following year. The first plague wave raged in Europe for three years, but the epidemic was not yet over. Milan was not affected until ten years later, and in 1370, as well as 1380, the plague flared up again. After that, nothing was as before. Around a third of the European population had been wiped out. From Florence, the chronicler Matteo Villani reported, since there were only a few people left and therefore had an abundance of land and property, they forgot the past as if it had never existed. The lower classes no longer wanted to work in the old professions, as men and women were overwhelmed by the abundance found in all areas. They also desired expensive and exquisite foods. When marriages took place, the children and women of low status dressed in all the beautiful and expensive garments of the nobles. Trade had significantly lost importance due to the plague, for who wanted to engage in trade in these times, when every stranger was viewed with suspicion out of fear that he might bring in the plague or poison the wells, but it would not be long before the great and powerful trading houses were founded. Hans Fugger, the progenitor of the famous merchant family, was just in the process of settling in Augsburg as a weaver. The depopulated cities granted immigration rights after each plague wave to compensate for the death rates, for many houses stood empty and threatened to decay. Craftsmanship has a golden foundation. After the gruesome decades, this was now the motto. In the cities, the rule of the guilds began. Shoemakers, bakers, butchers, stonemasons, and blacksmiths dominated the council assemblies. These were the citizens of the new middle class. In their work, one can most clearly recognize the dawn of a new era. Johannes Gutenberg was born around the year 1400. His invention of printing must have been a revolution. Suddenly, books and thus information became affordable for broad sections of the population. Many big and small inventions are now changing life. On church towers, you can more often see large clocks, and people are starting to measure work time not in days, but in hours. This is the new way of living, but it doesn't apply to everyone yet. The Middle Ages can't be easily shaken off in all areas. Knights still exist, but now in the 15th century, they are becoming more and more outdated. Once famous and respected as armoured riders against the hordes of Hungarians, they quickly shaped medieval life and were soon raised to the lower nobility. Splendid knightly tournaments, courtly love songs and knightly honour are closely linked to the Middle Ages. But now their time is ending. During the Crusades, armour became heavier. The light chainmail shirts were gradually replaced by iron armour, the plate armour, to better protect against enemy arrows. In response, the English developed the longbow, made from the best elastic yew wood. The lower end was braced against the ground. Only the strongest men could draw it with all their muscle power. The arrows hit their targets even at a distance of 200 meters, and their force could pierce even plate armor. Noble knights naturally looked down on bow weapons. Those were for the foot soldiers. But the foot soldiers, these peasant warriors, gradually made life difficult for the knights. They didn't fight honest, chivalrous battles with rules. They fought to win, and any means were acceptable to them. Honor didn't matter to them. With long spears, they formed tight groups. When a knight charged at them, the spears dug deep into the horses' bodies, and immediately they were on the fallen rider with their terrible halberds, causing gruesome wounds. The knight often didn't get the chance to use his sword. A wounded knight lying on the ground couldn't expect any mercy. 
the citizen militias and peasant warriors didn't try to ransom the noble relatives. They simply turned the knight, who could barely move in his armor, onto his stomach and stabbed their spikes into his unprotected flesh until the knight fell to the ground. The armor was valuable. The naked body was left lying. No, it was no longer the time of knights and knightly games that was beginning. While on one side, geniuses like Leonardo da Vinci were opening the doors to a new era, setting ideas in architecture, technology, astronomy, physics, anatomy, and not to forget painting. On the other side, the stubborn people clung to religious beliefs and witch mania. For them, the Middle Ages were far from over. Their bonfires would burn well into the 17th and 18th centuries. In December 1484, Pope Innocent VIII published a papal bull that went down in history as the Witch Bull. Not without great concern have we recently learned that in some parts of northern Germany, as well as in the provinces, cities and dioceses of Mainz, Cologne, Trier, Salzburg and Bremen, many people of both sexes, ignoring their own salvation and deviating from the Catholic faith, have dishonoured themselves by associating with devils and evil spirits. Through their spells, charms, incantations, and horrible witchcraft, they destroy the offspring of women and the young of animals. They ruin the crops of the earth, the grapes on the vines, and the fruit on the trees. Yes, they even curse men, women, and animals, as well as vineyards, orchards, gardens, meadows, pastures, rye, wheat, and other grains. These devilish beings plague and torment men and women herds and all kinds of animals with pain and disease, both inside and out. They prevent men from fathering children and women from conceiving, so that neither men with their wives nor women with their husbands can have sexual relations. Moreover, they renounce the faith they received through the sacrament of baptism and do not hesitate to commit the most horrible atrocities and excesses, harming the human soul, insulting the divine majesty, and causing trouble and being dangerous examples to many. There were already papal declarations against sorcerers and witches before. Witches were also burned before this time, but the Dominicans in charge of the Inquisition didn't make a big deal out of it. It happened more casually and quietly. That was about to change. Encouraged by the Pope's bull, two zealous witch-believing Dominicans appeared before the Holy Father, Heinrich Kramer and Jacob Sprenger. Both had many years of experience in witch persecution and obtained from Pope Innocent the Tain a decree granting them exclusive authority in matters concerning witches. With this power, they could act against suspects at their own discretion. What was missing for a large-scale witch-hunt was a guide for practical actions when a suspect was found. So they wrote a handbook for the witch-hunter, the Malleus Maleficarum, Hammer of Witches. Pope Innocent VIII was very pleased with the commitment of the two monks, because with this tool it was possible to eradicate everything that wasn't Bible-believing or loyal to the Pope. Heretics and witches were now grouped together, and the term heretic was redefined. Belief in witches was now closely linked to the Christian faith, and from now on, anyone who didn't believe in witches was a heretic. On one hand, this allowed the elimination of the last remnants of non-Christian superstitions. On the other hand, they now had a useful tool against the new thinking that was spreading everywhere in the Pope's God state. However, there were people who valued reason, or should everyone know that reason equals heresy because it stands in the way of faith? And faith is now, by papal bull, belief in witches. Thanks to the new art of printing, the book became a bestseller. By 1669, it had seen 29 editions and was translated into several languages. The judge shall begin the process by issuing a general summons in the following manner, by posting it on the doors of the church or the town hall. Since we strive with all our efforts and from the bottom of our hearts, want the Christian people entrusted to us to be diligently nurtured in the unity and clarity of the Catholic faith and kept away from all heretical depravity, 
we command, under the penalty of excommunication within the next twelve days, that if anyone knows, has seen, or heard, that any person is of ill reputation or suspected as a heretic or witch, and especially that they practice anything capable of harming humans, livestock, or crops, they should reveal it to us. If anyone does not obey our aforementioned warnings and commands with the effect that they do not reveal the above within the appointed time, let them know that they are pierced by the sword of excommunication. It was now every citizen's duty to denounce anyone they distrusted. Otherwise, they would be struck by the Pope's ban. Anyone who got caught in the mills of the Inquisition had no chance of survival. Just as heretics are allowed to testify against heretics, so too are sorcerers allowed to testify against witches, but always against and not for them. Likewise, wives, sons, and relatives may testify against and not for them, because their testimony is more effective as evidence. Anyone who testified in favor of a suspect was automatically also under suspicion and thus fell into the clutches of the Inquisition. Once caught, there was no escape. Therefore it is clear, as the general court procedure demands, that no accused is sentenced to blood punishment unless convicted by their own confession. Although they are held as manifest in heretical depravity and are indicated as such, they will in any case be subjected to painful questioning and torture to obtain a confession. And to clarify the matter, an incident that occurred in Speyer and became known to many people may be assumed. As a certain honourable man was passing by a certain woman and did not wish to agree to the sale of a certain item at her behest, she angrily called after him, Soon you will wish you had agreed, or words of similar intent, which is the usual way witches speak. He, being displeased with her, and not without reason, turned his face back to look at her to see in what intent she had uttered the words, and behold, he was suddenly seized by a possession, his face extending in a horrid distortion sideways up to his ears, and he could not pull it back, but remained in this condition for a long time. There are four ways to convict the accused, either by legal witnesses and torture tools, by evidence of the deed, by legal inference, for example, that the accused had been summoned several times, or by strong suspicion, this was now the God-state on earth under the sole rule of the Pope. For many hundreds of thousands it was good night. Heartfelt daughter, innocent I am tortured and must die. They applied the thumb screws to me until the blood flowed, and shortly after I was tortured eight times. This writing must remain hidden. Good night, I shall see you no more. While all of Europe lit up brightly in the glow of the pyres, the popes basked in the splendor of their godlike power. Was this truly God's state on earth? On the throne, the pope as the Almighty, and around him the brightly blazing purgatories of sin. No, it was rather a last stand of medieval thinking against the new era that was dawning. From Italy came the new ideas. The Medici family, enriched through banking, ruled Florence. Cosimo de' Medici founded the Platonic Academy, where artists and thinkers of the new era soon gathered. Here, the dogmatic mindset of the Middle Ages was already overcome. Man, in his essence, became the center of attention. Eagerly, the great works of Greek antiquity were read and discussed. Plato, Socrates, Pythagoras. In architecture, the new thinking found expression, and again it was Cosimo de' Medici who generously awarded commissions. Brunelleschi and Michelozzo created the mighty Cathedral Dome and the Palazzo Medici. Lorenzo de' Medici, also called the Magnificent, followed in his grandfather Cosimo's footsteps and led Florence in the second half of the 15th century to an unparalleled bloom. He advocated a policy of balance among the Italian city-states. Himself a talented poet, he gathered leading humanists around him and eagerly promoted the arts. 
The young Florentine Michelangelo Buonarroti was among his protégés and was considered a rising talent in sculpture and painting. He would also make a name for himself as an architect in the construction of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. This awakening into the modern age is called the Renaissance. It was felt everywhere, not just in Florence. In Granada, a young man from Genoa campaigned for his plans to discover a new sea route to India. He believed in the spherical shape of the earth and wanted to sail westward. Queen Isabella of Castile listened to him and supported the daring venture. He would discover America, Christopher Columbus. North of the Alps, the spirit of departure was gradually being felt. The scholar Erasmus of Rotterdam was already enjoying great renown in wide circles. In his Handbook of the Christian Knight, he advocated a free, rational Christianity that emphasized the moral content of the New Testament. He developed a plan to avoid future wars. All Christian states should form a comprehensive alliance. Each country should be assured a precisely defined territory. No expansions, no special agreements, or outdated claims should be legitimate. Renaissance and humanism stirred everywhere as heralds of a new era. The horizon of humanity was expanding, and soon the insights of the new sciences about the nature of things would irrevocably replace the dogmas of faith. In Rome, the construction of St. Peter's Basilica began in 1506. The papal court could now rival that of ancient Roman emperors. Financial problems soon arose. Pope Leo VI knew how to help himself. The Holy Father issued a bull in which indulgences were proclaimed to all who would promote the construction of St. Peter's through monetary contributions. The entire Christian world was now divided into various districts, and travellers from the great Roman trading houses were sent there under the title of papal legates or commissioners. The letters of indulgence sold by these travellers, the deputies of God's vicar, read as follows. In the name of our Most Holy Father, the Vicar of Jesus Christ, I absolve you first from all church censures which you may have incurred. Next, from all misdeeds and crimes you have committed up to now, however great and grave they may be, even those which only the Pope can forgive, I fully remit all punishments you ought to endure in purgatory for your sins. I restore you to participation in the sacraments of the Church and to the communion of the faithful, and I re-establish you anew in the innocent and pure state in which you were at baptism, so that when you die, the gates of punishment and torment shall be closed, and you may enter into the joys of paradise. In the papal chancery tax, the price was set for which the most heinous sins were forgiven, parricide, incest, infanticide, abortion, adultery of all kinds, unnatural lust, perjury. In short, everything called sin or crime found its price here. Such graces cannot be partaken by the poor, for they have no money. Thus, they must forego the comfort, it says at the end of the holy price list. For the payment of twelve ducats, clergy were allowed to engage in fornication, adultery, incest, and sodomy that is, unchastity with animals. Leo Dex found it advantageous to lease the indulgence in some districts to large enterprises for fixed sums. The general lessees had their sub -lessees. A comprehensive network of money channels soon spread across the Christian world, and all channels led to Rome. One of the best indulgence sellers was the Dominican monk Johann Tetzel from Pirna, he carried around an iron chest adorned with the papal coat of arms, went from market to market and sang, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Everywhere he gathered large crowds around him. He boasted that he had saved more souls from hell through indulgences than the Apostle Peter had converted heathens through preaching the gospel. He could forgive not only sins already committed, but also those one intended to commit, and the power of his indulgence was so great that there was no sin that couldn't be atoned for through it. Behold, the heaven is open to you all. If you don't want to enter now, 
When will you enter, O oh, foolish and stubborn people, almost like wild animals who do not understand how to appreciate the great waste and outpouring of papal grace? So many souls could be redeemed from purgatory, you stubborn and lazy ones. You can with twelve groschen pull your father out of purgatory, and yet you are so ungrateful that you don't want to help your parents in such great need. On Judgment Day, I will not take the blame for this. Intense criticism arose against the Roman Church's commercialism. On October 31, 1517, it was impossible for the citizens of Wittenberg to ignore it. It hung large on the door of their castle church. Martin Luther, doctor of theology and teacher of biblical interpretation in Wittenberg, had posted it there to invite public discussion about it. His 95 theses on indulgence led to a heated dispute with Johann Tetzel. During the confrontation, Luther increasingly opposed the Roman Church. At the Leipzig debate in 1519, he finally denied the infallibility of the councils and claimed that the emergence of the papacy had purely human historical causes. This was followed by the papal threat of excommunication. Luther publicly burned the bull. This was his final break with the Roman Church and the beginning of the Reformation. The Reformation ended the Middle Ages, and the Roman Church would never again possess unrestricted power. In the time of the Renaissance and Humanism, the Western world began to finally break the chains of the Middle Ages.